Good morning and good afternoon, um, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kamal Ramsing. I'm the chairperson of ZA Space, uh, our industry body for the space sector here in South Africa. And it's my absolute privilege to wish you the warmest of South African welcomes, wherever you might be in the world. Um, so this SEBS event, we, we are hoping, will be the very first of many, many industry to industry virtual summits to come. Collaboration is now the cornerstone of our new economy. And where better to start than with one of our fellow BRICS members? So a special note of welcome to all the colleagues um, uh, from, from Brazil. Uh, we understand that Brazil has now more than 50% of the entire registration of this event. So thank you very much for making the effort, taking the time to be here today. Uh, our focus is really about getting to know each other, getting to know our businesses, getting to know the opportunities, and to actively seek ways to collaborate and grow mutually. Very exciting. And of course, not to forget, we've got close to 20 other countries represented in this event today. Welcome to each and every one of you as well. And we, we're all very excited about getting to meet you over the next two days. And the next two days really is all about that. It's all about growth of the industry, growth of the individual businesses. Uh, and day two in particular is going to be focused on that, on that. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Of course, as the industry body, we have the easiest of tasks. We have a very simple mission. We need to connect businesses to each other and then get out of the way. So we need to connect business to, businesses to each other and allow businesses to do what businesses do, which is to actively find those opportunities to innovate, to collaborate, and eventually to grow. Our countries, our industries need you to grow. Day two has been set aside for the perfect opportunity to do that with our business to business meetings. Uh, where you can spend time with, with counterparts from all across the world, understanding each other's businesses and understanding and looking for those opportunities. And no chair on day two, you, you would uh, have received links already to, to set up your profile for day two, to set up your meetings for day two. This might have ended up in your junk email. So we do apologize for that. It does happen from time to time. But please take some time to go and look for these emails, set up your profile, set up your meetings for tomorrow uh, and enjoy the value of connecting with each other across the ocean. Of course, day one is all about context. It's about us understanding the nature of the sector in each of our countries, understanding the challenges and the opportunities and the broad spectrum of, of, of potential uh, that, that we each represent. And it, it's really to get us going with some of that context, it's my absolute honor to, to introduce one of the strongest supporters of this event in, in, in particular, His Excellency, the ambassador uh, uh, to, to um, Ab ambassador of Brazil to South Africa, uh, Sergio Danese. Mr. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you so much for your support and for making the time to be here. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much. I trust you're hearing me well. Uh, well, Mr. Val Mouzami, CEO of the South African National Space Agency, Sir Kamal Ram Singh, Chairman of the ZASA Space, Mr. Rodrigo Mendes, Executive Manager of International Business Development of the Brazilian Aerospace Cluster, Mr. Herbert Kimura, Director of Strategic Intelligence and New Business, and Mr. Alessandro Carvalho, Head of the International Cooperation Office of the Brazilian Space Agency. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends from Brazil and South Africa, it is with great satisfaction that I welcome you to this event aiming at bringing together the space industries of Brazil and South Africa. I'm most thankful for, to the South African and Brazilian institutions that co-organized the event diligently and with remarkable enthusiasm. ZA Space, the South African National Space Agency and the Brazilian Aerospace Cluster. May I also thank the Innovation Diplomacy Program from the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and of course, the Brazilian Space Agency, which are both supporting this event. Secretary of the Brazilian Embassy, Elena Jornada, was pivotal in turning this webinar into reality, and I thank her for her enthusiasm and diligence. I would like to express my warmest 
thanks to all the panelists who accepted to share their thoughts on such an important subject as the space industry and the potential for cooperation and association between Brazil and South Africa in that field. Their commitment is key to the success of this initiative, which hopefully will last with concrete and fruitful results, especially on the business field. There is an urgent need for us to present concrete initiatives in the context of the strategic partnership that Brazil and South Africa committed to a little more than 10 years ago. As resolute developing countries, as proud members of BRICS, IBSA, and the G20, and as truly equal partners in many fields, Brazil and South Africa must show that they are capable of developing strong bilateral relations based on an intense partnership. It is at the bilateral level that we can have a positive and lasting impact on our economies, on our scientific and technological development, on our people's lives. This is why we are engaging in promising initiatives such as this one, which we hope will begin to bear fruits in the short term. The Brazilian Embassy in South Africa is active also in other promising fields of a true cooperation between equals, such as biofuels, agri-tech, the defense industry, the environment, the management of natural parks, and the formation of our career diplomatic services. Cooperation in the space field has a concrete and symbolic potential in our relations. This event is one of the many possible spillover effects of the successful signing of the MOU between the Brazilian and South African space agencies last November. The fact that there is already a framework for cooperation between the two government institutions is encouraging and it inspired us to seek collaboration in this very practical area with a special focus on industry and the private sector. More and more, space technologies are becoming a bigger part of our daily lives. We might not even realize it, but when we order a car through an app or check the weather or even use our cell phones, we are using space technology. This field is very promising and, it's, it, and it is growing exponentially, offering fantastic opportunities for those who can see beyond our already vast horizons. We have to make sure our countries are part of this journey in a clear way. And that is what we're trying to do by focusing over these two days on demystifying space for business across the South Atlantic. This event aims not only to break a barrier and show that space economy is for everyone, but also to break the North-South divide when it comes to discussing high-end technologies. We tend to assume developing countries cannot take an active role in this field. Well, this event is quite innovative by bringing two countries from the global south together to address space issues as equal partners with similar capabilities, challenges, and potential. More than that, with a full session dedicated to matchmaking, we intend not only to discuss the issue, but also to translate it into business and other forms of cooperation and association. The similarities and affinities we share cannot be limited to the rhetorical level. They must be translated into actions that will bring more prosperity and development to our peoples. And this is what this webinar is all about. So on behalf of the Brazilian government, I wish you all great discussions, great interactions, and successful matchmaking rounds. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That was really, really motivating and I think sets the tone for, for our focus over the next two days. Really appreciate the time. The next person who has also been very, very active in, in putting this event together, uh, Mr. Rodrigo Mendez, Executive Manager for International Business Development at the Brazilian Aerospace Cluster. Welcome, Rodrigo. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, this uh, summit between Brazil and South Africa for the space industry, uh, it's been a, a, a very strong effort from the Brazilian Aerospace Cluster and the Associated of Technology Park, along with uh, Brazilian Embassy in uh, South Africa and uh, ZA Space. Uh, so I would like to thank 
Kamal and his team, and also His Excellency uh, Ambassador Sergio Danesi and all his team uh, for making this uh, possible. And I also like to thank everyone uh, that is uh, present here today and all our panelists uh, and speakers for today. Uh, I would like to uh, also say a few words about uh, the Brazilian uh, aerospace industry on, on general, uh, as the San José dos Campos Technology Parks managed the Brazilian aerospace cluster, that uh, an association that joins more than 100 companies in the aerospace field uh, uh, with the supply chain of aeronautics, but also in defense and space sectors. Uh, and we have also uh, started a new vertical and we are working strongly with also another cluster that we have here in the region, which is our IT cluster, uh, in order to support the companies uh, on an effort to access the so-called new space economy. We believe, as also uh, the ambassador mentioned, uh, all the new technologies and new trends, uh, they go through uh, or they pass through uh, space technologies and IT, uh, that being on upstream or downstream, so all the applications, we are always looking into the cross-section on space and, and IT. Uh, so we've been working uh, very strong in this uh, multi-cluster, multi-sector interaction uh, to support the Brazilian companies in, in also accessing the space economy. So it's a very great pleasure to uh, be here and, and share with all of you uh, the, uh, the opportunities and uh, the business opportunities that we have uh, working together in uh, the south part of the world, in the South Hemisphere, uh, between two countries that have a long history on uh, partnerships, and I'm sure that we can work together and find uh, great opportunities to uh, foster and, and, and make our businesses strong. Uh, and for sure, Brazilian companies and South African companies working together and developing new technologies to apply to space sector, uh, I believe it's a, a very good thing for both of our countries. And I'm sure we will have from today, uh, especially uh, on the discussions about the, uh, the scenario and dismissifying our uh, space industry, but even more tomorrow during the B2B sessions uh, that we'll be holding uh, to uh, start the connections that come out uh, very well said. We, we do the bridge, we connect, and then we step out. So uh, the companies can do what they do best, which is business and uh, strong our economies. So that's uh, actually the, 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 the main objective of this event, to connect you companies uh, and, and, and entrepreneurs and, 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 and businessmen of the space economy. Uh, so both our countries can uh, be more present in this industry. So. Uh, thank you once again to all the panelists, to everyone uh, joining uh, us. Uh, it's a great pleasure. We'll be here throughout the day and tomorrow during the B2Bs. Uh, I will be with you during the whole event. Uh, so thank you very much. Have a great uh, evening for our South African friends, a great morning for the Brazilian friends. Uh, and let's do business. Thank you very much. Fantastic way to end, Rodrigo. Thank you. Let's do business. Uh, I, I think there's already lessons learned. I think your extension into the IT sector is a, a, a lesson that we took away when we first met to, to include the downstream and, and uh, stimulate downstream if you want. That's, that's a great learning. And yes, our countries have a great history of, of collaboration. So, so let's take it to space. Um, so before I, I hand over to our first keynote speaker, I think we're getting into the content now where you may have uh, questions or points of clarity that you'd like to raise. Uh, if you look at the bottom of your, of your Zoom call, for those of you who haven't used this facility before, you'll see a Q&A chat facility. So if you can keep your, your questions on the Q&A uh, per speaker, I think that will certainly help 
if you have questions that you'd like to raise, it will, it will allow the speaker to, to respond to you directly uh, or as soon as they can. So our first keynote speaker um, is someone who has been incredibly supportive of, of uh, ZS Space through our inception and to all the work that we do. Uh, a great pleasure to introduce the Chief Executive Officer of the South African National Space Agency, Mr. Val Mutsalmi. Val, welcome. Thank you again, uh, and, and all the best for the, for the next few minutes. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Kamal. Um, sorry, I just need to get my presentation up, and then I'm going to run. Um, okay. okay. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of a chat. In the show. Okay, Kamal, I'm just going to talk to the uh, the presentation itself. So I, I seem to have a snag. Uh, let me just see if I can just do this quickly because it'll be useful for me to show the presentation. Uh, okay. There we go. Okay, first of all, a very big thank you, Kamal, and to our Brazilian counterparts for this uh, industry to industry workshop. And I'm titling it the Fostering the Industry in Industry Collab Collaboration. And I thought I'd just put some few ideas on the table so that we could uh, stimulate the conversations over the next two days, essentially. Um, I wanted to start off by just focusing on a few proverbs. Um, you know, the, the first one, it says that it takes a child, it takes a village to raise a child. And that means effectively that whatever, you know, when you look at ourselves as human beings, as children, especially, we, we need teachers, we need parents, uh, we need doctors um, to engage with the child at a social level. And the same applies even for specific initiatives that we want to engage in. You need a various skill sets and entire ecosystem to support that kind of an initiative. The second says that if you want to go quickly, you go alone. But if you want to go far, you go together. And so this talks about the collaborative aspect in terms of working together uh, on collaborative initiatives. And then the third aspect in terms of a proverb it says, if you give a person a fish, you feed them for a day. But if you teach a person to fish and you feed them for life. Now, this is very important from you know, many space programs where we sort of just import technologies uh, into the country. And you can feed yourself for a day, but you don't feed yourself for life. So the issue around capacity development and having the uh, inherent capacity to actually engage at a, you know, an expert level uh, in a space program is very, very critical. And so this talks to the human capital development aspects. So there's two things that come through from these various proverbs. The first one is collaboration. Uh, and the second one is self-sustainability, ensuring that you have the human capital at hand. And I think this is core for even the conversation today we're having around the industry to industry collaboration. But what I wanted to point out, and maybe more from the South African side, and you know, when we're engaging this conversation, to see how some of these aspects can be mirrored uh, across from the Brazilian side as well. And I wanted to underscore the kind of relationship that Sansa and Zarspace Inc. is more or less entering into. And there's four key elements that I think we, we have agreed upon. And so, you know, when we're seeing the growth of the national space program, we also see the industry as part of that ecosystem. And when I talk about industry, I'm talking about universities, I'm talking about the public sector institutions and the private sector as well. And so when we look at industry, we look at that as a collective. So when we're engaging in a space program, we're looking at working with the industry forum, in this case being Zarspace Inc. Um, and looking at the co-creation of the space ecosystem. So the space agency doesn't come and assume that it has the answers to all of the issues that it has to deal with, but it works hand in glove with the space industry forum to start to co-create that ecosystem. And I think this is essentially the road ahead between what Sansa and Zospace Inc are aiming to do going forward. 
Another aspect in terms of where SANS or the agency features is one of our core mandates is research, development, and innovation. And there again, it's not R&D and innovation inside of the agency, it's inside the ecosystem. So how do we bring in our partners through Zarspace Inc? And that's a very critical component in terms of growing the space sector in terms of that capacity that I spoke about. And then collectively, we have to ensure that there's an effective market response and market access as well. And this is where Sansa can play a role. So for example, when we lead international delegations abroad, we are not essentially marketing one company. We are marketing the entire industry called Zarspace Inc. And that's very key in terms of how we, as a space agency, create that platform for Zarspace Inc. to step into that, um, those opportunities. And ideally, what we are trying to do collectively is create those opportunity spaces for economic growth and sustainability uh, from a national space program perspective. And I think some of the conversation points we want to see in terms of the industry to industry collaboration or conversation is how do you intersect in, in terms of these various different segments that I'm, I'm just talking about. The one thing we have to take into account in this conversation is how this particular uh, workshop has come to being and where it's heading into. So we started off in November last year, looking at the Senza um, Brazilian Space Agency MOU, which was signed in November last year. And then now we're having the industry engagement, uh, industry to industry engagement, which is now in May, 2021. But effectively, that MOU and this particular engagement is setting the scenes in terms of what's coming into the future. So those are underscoring the, the, the kind of collaborative opportunities between South Africa and Brazil that will come through from some of these conversations. So what I'm hoping that will come through in the next few years is the strengthening of this collaboration in terms of leveraging on our collective resources for these kind of collaborative opportunities. And then I think what's also important to note is that when you look at the MOU in terms of what the two space agencies have agreed upon, there's five areas that we said we wanted to work on collectively as the uh, interagency uh, relationship. The first one is satellite development, that's nano satellites and CubeSats. The second is on staff and student exchange, uh, and that's uh, speaks to the various exchange programs that we can set up. And then the third one is space science. We want to look at space weather, science payloads, space physics research. So that underscores some of the R&D that we've been talking about. And then when you look at earth observation, how do we work together in terms of developing applications, software development. And then when you go to the satellite data itself is the applications development, but also the sharing of data. And a good example at the moment is South Africa's use of CBARS data, the China-Brazil Earth Resource Satellite. So can we, for example, have a satellite platform, a shared satellite platform between South Africa and Brazil, where we share the data, develop, uh, co-develop the applications, and sort of stimulate that ecosystem, both upstream and downstream. So I think in terms of the conversation that the industry segments are entering into, you have to take stock of what we have agreed to as an agency because that will essentially uh, underpin some of the collaborative opportunities that you, you will be looking at in the next few days. And I think my final slide is that from, you know, when I look at from a space agency point of view, there are various different elements when you're looking at it from an industry perspective. So from a SANSA perspective, we're not necessarily going to be implementing programs inside of the agency. We are going to rely on our ecosystem uh, so, for example, on the upstream side, if we are building satellites for the country, we will do the very high level system engineering, but the rest of it gets farmed out to the industry, we contract the industry. And then if you look at downstream uh, development of products and services, uh, Sansa is also not going to be fully engaged in terms of products and services or the development of those products and services. We're going to be contracting uh, the industry to come and assist in terms of developing those products and services. So both upstream and downstream, we'll be looking at uh, the development of those products and services. And then the third element is the uptake by the industry in terms of those products and services, whether it's the telecoms, earth observation, or global navigation satellite services. 
And these are not necessarily the space industry, it could be the non-space industry as well. So there's very different opportunity spaces along the space value chain, upstream, downstream, and then also the uptake by the non-space segments. And I think this is where the industry to industry sort of conversation that we're having today is very critical in terms of how you engage in these various opportunity spaces. So Kamal, I thought I'd just uh, present some context in terms of how the conversation can be taken through in the next two days. And from a space agency point of view, from SANSA perspective, and I'm sure my uh, colleague from uh, the Brazilian space agency will all also agree, we wanna see how the industry identifies those, identify those collaborative opportunities, which falls under the umbrella between the two space agency agreements and how when the agency sort of move, there's an industry that's supporting us from, uh, from the back end, but also how the industry kind of find their own opportunity spaces in terms of working with each other. So I'm quite uh, uh, positive in terms of what will come out of this conversation. And I'm hoping that it will re lead to uh, a number of years of fruitful engagement going forward. So Kamal, from that perspective, I really appreciate this platform. I'm looking forward to the outcomes of the, the conversations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Val. Um, and, and thanks for those, those, those five pointers. I think that's, that's good guardrails. Of course, industry will potentially add another five to it if you leave it to us. Um, but I think that's, that's a very good point. Um, there are a few minutes in hand, um, and there's a question that's been directed to you. Um, I don't know if you can see it on the chat at the bottom of your screen. Um, um, I'll look at the chat. The Q&A, the Q&A chat. Is there a specific question that directed to me? I'm uh, seeing a couple of questions. Uh, okay, it's, it's, from, it's from Christian and he is asking, he's, he suggested uh, to you as well that uh, is there a plan to look at a blockchain type event I, I can't see it here as well right now um, oh. our question is do you plan a blockchain in space architecture between Africa and Brazil for defense and civil decentralized application I think that's a possibility and maybe this should come out of this industry workshop uh, industry to industry engagement and I think uh, as I said uh, in my opening slide the kind of relationship between SANS and Zarspace Inc. is to co-create the ecosystem. So if that is a kind of an idea that's coming through, even from Zarspace Inc. or from both sides of the fence, Brazil and South Africa, let's explore that. And so we're open to all of these kind of ideas. Thank you, Val. Uh, thanks very much again. Um, our next speaker, uh, Val, Val actually referred to as the, as the president of the Brazilian Space uh, Agency, uh, unfortunately, Mr. Carlos Moura won't be with us today. He's been called into a uh, quite an urgent meeting, but he has sent us a pre-recorded video. And if I could ask um, our, our, our manager of events, Mr. Herman Teron, to help us with starting up that video from, from uh, Mr. Moura, that would be much appreciated. industry and more possibilities for cooperation. 
Over the years, Brazil has implemented numerous initiatives with a view to developing space capabilities that deliver benefits to society. Such ventures invariably comprise the international cooperation as an essential tool for the acquisition of new scientific and technological knowledge to our government agencies, academia and industry. Recognizing the importance of these partnerships, we signed a Memorandum of Understanding in November 2020 with the purpose of strengthening the ties between Brazil and South Africa. And that has Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the space sector has entered an era of major transformation. Its economic importance has increased over the past decade as new commercial actors developed innovative projects and services highly responsive to market needs. If, on the one hand, government investments remained crucial to support the overall space infrastructure, science and research and development. On the other, a disruptive and commercially driven ecosystem has emerged, marked by unprecedented ventures, featuring innovative schemes and business models. Evolution in recent years has brought many countries and non-state actors into the sector, resulting in a growing complexity within this booming industry and more possibilities for cooperation. Over the years, Brazil has implemented numerous initiatives with a view to developing space capabilities that deliver benefits to society. Such ventures invariably comprise the international cooperation as an essential tool for the acquisition of new scientific and technological knowledge to our government agencies, academia and industry. Recognizing the importance of these partnerships, we signed a Memorandum of Understanding in November 2020 with the purpose of strengthening the ties between Brazil and South Africa. And that has brought us to this moment in which we gather to attend the Brazil-South Africa Space Industry Virtual Summit to identify potential partnership opportunities between our industries. In an attempt to introduce you to Brazil's potential in space solutions and services, I refer to some aspects that surround one of the most recent and relevant milestones of the Brazilian space program, the launch of the Amazonia One satellite, which took place in February this year. There was a particularly significant event. Besides adding to the expansion of our spatial assets applied in remote sensing, it consolidated the effort and sophistication imprinted in previous projects that contributed to the advance and training of the Brazilian industry in the development of a wide range of components, space subsystems and systems qualified for orbital flights. Brazil's first homemade optical satellite, the Amazonia One, is perfect to illustrate that. Its design and solar panel opening mechanisms were entirely developed by our national industry. Such expertise enabled us to expand our operations abroad, leading to the inauguration of brands and facilities in countries like the United States. Regarding the development of satellite solutions, the Brazilian industry 
will soon launch another nanosatellite that will support agricultural activities, monitor the environment, and collect water and meteorological data. This artifact, the v cube one will carry a high-resolution camera with high radiometric quality, being such piece of equipment also manufactured in Brazil. This solution will also feature a data collection system that may serve the IoT market, even in areas with limited infrastructure. Within a few years, a VQ-based constellation will be able to provide super high resolution services. The VCube and other satellite solutions will be capable of meeting our country's needs both in land and on our vast jurisdictional waters. We have thus tangible opportunities to develop solutions that meet our common interests in the South Atlantic region. The Brazilian Space Agency has identified the increased participation of startups in space projects. Indeed, we seek opportunities at the local and the international levels to engage in further cooperation, bringing Brazilian solutions to develop by companies headquartered in our technological parks, notably the one located in São José dos Campos, which is one of the main sponsors of this event. On to a different approach, allow me to emphasize that Brazil also has a solution that provides for the conduction of microgravity experiments. The VSB-30 sounding rocket enables the Brazilian industry to carry out experiments in several domains, including the scientific, biological, medical, and metallurgical ones just to name a few. Our rocket relies on the infrastructure provided by the Alcantara Space Center to access space and constitutes a platform capable of meeting bilateral interests and partnerships. Regarding the Alcantara Spaceport, I'd like to note that earlier this year, the Brazilian Space Agents, in partnership with the Brazilian Air Force, has announced the first company selected to carry non-governmental space launch operations. Such event kicks off a new chapter for space activities in Brazil and constitutes an unparalleled opportunity to explore collaboration and partnerships with other countries, contributing to development of their own space programs. As the Alcantara Spaceport starts operating as an unmatched commercial space launch hub, other industries, ranging from services to logistics and infrastructure, are expected to thrive in the region and in other Brazilian locations associated with the space sector. To finish this brief overview of Brazilian space capabilities, which comprise ground infrastructure, space access, and satellite development, I cannot help but mention our interest in providing space-based applications. It's our intention to build further capaci capacity and improve national performance in the downstream segment, offering solutions that support inter alia the mon monitoring of the environment critical infrastructure, and weather conditions that optimize agricultural activities. We understand that taking a firmer stand on this domain will enable us to deliver substantial benefits to our society and economy. I conclude these remarks, reminding you that nations invest in space to fulfill national objectives that include economic growth and diversification, inspiration and STEM education, increased in scientific knowledge, technology innovation, advancement of national space capabilities, greater participation in international agreements and in joint programs. Brazil and South Africa should capitalize on their substantive involvement in space 
to shape and encourage the establishment of improved partnerships. Indeed, space cooperation is key for us to address global challenges, take advantage of the growing commercial space ecosystem, foster growth and maximize collaboration avenues, further developing the space programs of both our countries and delivering social and economic benefits for all. Africa and South America share the South Atlantic historical and cultural roots, in addition to facing similar social, economic and environmental challenges. In this context, Brazil and South Africa have what it takes to lead the way, designing and implementing synergistic projects that ultimately turn into success stories to be showcased to other emerging spacefaring nations. May events like this one inspire us to strengthen existing ties and engage in new conversations and ventures. As once said by unforgettable Nelson Mandela, the charismatic South African political leader we all admired and wanted to be friends with, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. You nailed it, Madiba, for there are numerous precious dreams waiting to be turned into reality by brave South African and Brazilian spacefarers, investors, authorities, policy and decision makers who do not fear taking the next step and bringing in space a little closer to Earth. Thank you very much. Since Mr. Morella, thank you for those incredibly motivating words. And I see the, the intelligence of, of, of doing a, a pre recorded session, those graphics were phenomenal as well. Um, I've been told that the representatives of Mr. Morella will gladly take questions if there are any. Uh, we do have a few minutes. So, so if you have any questions about the content that's just been shared, I don't see any new questions on the, on the Q&A chat group. Um, uh, I, I see one hand up. Uh, is that a question? Uh, can we, uh, Herman, can we allow that question? Is that is that channel open? I will allow them to talk. Uh, okay. It's Adam Wilson, that hand is raised, and I think there was a second hand there as well. some reason that's still muted. Okay. So, uh, I mean, that, that Q&A um, channel isn't working. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to move on and, and maybe ask that that question is put onto the, the Q&A chat, if that's, if that's okay. And we can still respond to it in a, in a little bit. Very good. So, so we've heard from the space agencies, we've heard from uh, the embassy, um, you've heard myself talk about the, uh, and Rodrigo speak about the phenomenal potential in partnership and the excitement. And if the intensity of the activity on the chat group is anything to go by, there clearly are some, some, some really uh, uh, fantastic opportunities that are going to present themselves in these B2B sessions. You've seen the prompts to please register, set up your profile, set up your meetings, etc. for tomorrow's B2B. We now have to listen to, to, the, to, the, to the, let's say, the knowledgeable sources of understanding what are the realities of doing business. As entrepreneurs, as business people, we know that moving from, from idea to, to, to concept into businesses, into scaled businesses, is, is sometimes easier said than done. So to help us understand some of those, we've got two speakers, one from Brazil talking about doing business in Brazil, and then one from South Africa doing business in South Africa. We're going to start with Mr. Mr. Ali Hash, who's a partner with infrastructure, within infrastructure and projects for Verano from Brazil. So he's going to talk to us about doing business in Brazil. Welcome, sir. The floor is yours. Kamal, many thanks. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a uh, true honor uh, to have an opportunity to speak to you today uh, a bit about doing business in Brazil and 
especially with the space sector in mind. Uh, as, as Kamal already introduced me, I am Ali Haj. I am a partner with the projects and infrastructure practice of Verano Advogados. Verano is uh, a leading full service law firm in Brazil, advising clients in every area of law. And we commonly support international companies coming into Brazil to pursue the business interests, as well as local companies doing business with international players. It is a huge challenge to talk about doing business in Brazil in, in the time that we have. Uh, and I, I will try to select a few topics that uh, we think that it's the, are the key uh, ones to have in mind of the uh, foreign investors when considering co coming to do business in Brazil. Um, I think it's a, it's a very interesting time uh, for the Brazilian space sector. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the uh, great examples uh, that were mentioned in uh, Mr. Carlos Moura's video is really the implementation of the Alcantara Space Center with, and the recent award uh, by the Brazilian government to companies that will be performing commercial launch operations uh, uh, from, 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 the bay, from the space center, and uh, which really uh, starts putting Brazil uh, in, in a new era in terms of, the, and, and really in the path of um, entering and becoming uh, a real uh, space economy. Uh, so Brazil is, it is an attractive econ economy and affords several opportunities to investors in general. Okay, I, I think uh, I am uh, confident to say that Brazil uh, has a very robust legal system uh, which provides for protection of foreign investors. Uh, but I have to admit that uh, it is a very complex environment that requires knowledge, needs to be understood, you know, to properly navigate through it. Uh, the, I mean, I think that really, I, I will try to, to go or, or topic by topic here, but to only a few of them and, and very on a very high level, uh, because as I said, there's a lot of detail to it and uh, we, we unfortunately don't have time to, to, to address them. But I think that to start, I think one very important statement to make is that, you know, Brazil does not discriminate foreign and domestic capital or investments. So, uh, you know, subject to, you know, the applicable rules, uh, the, the legal protection available to investments in Brazil are, are equally available to local and foreign players. Um, so the, but of course, as I said, there are rules to be followed uh, and, and, you know, notably in relation to exchange controls, uh, legal representation in country, and, you know, especially if you are from, from if you will uh, operate in a regulated sector, there will be a number of uh, other regulations to be followed as well. Uh, but going first to uh, talk about, you know, the, the inflow and outflow of funds uh, into Brazil, uh, the Brazilian Central Bank controls the movement of, uh, of uh, and the, the trade of uh, foreign currencies in, in the country. So uh, practically all transactions involving uh, foreign currencies like loans, capital injections, dividend payments, uh, you know, importation, exportations, they will be subject to specific registrations, you know, presentation of documents, and which, which is uh, mostly procedural, but still very important uh, to be complied with and, and to avoid penalties and, and, and delays, most importantly. I think, uh, you know, one, one common topic that you will hear from me uh, today is that, you know, planning and, and knowledge about the procedures and the rules are, are very important because in, they, are the, they are the things that probably are, are going to you know, make your, pro, your project run you know, more efficiently and, and you, that you meet your deadlines, you, you meet your, uh, your, your, your schedules. Um, so most business in Brazil, if a company is coming to Brazil to do business, uh, the most common uh, structure is uh, to set up a local uh, subsidiary, a local company. Uh, there are uh, different types of, of companies uh, that, uh, that you, can, uh, you can establish in country. They, um, they, they, 
they really have uh, you know more simple or complex uh, structures depending on on the type of you know governance structure and shareholders rights that you want to set up uh, but it is i think that overall uh, the 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 part of business structure in brazil uh, from a legal perspective i think it's uh, it's quite uh, consistent with international practice uh, you know, investors are able to set up, as I said, wholly owned subsidiaries. They can incorporate uh, uh, other types of companies. They can have unincorporated joint ventures, incorporated joint ventures, uh, special purpose companies. Uh, all of that uh, is, is possible and there are ways to, to, to structure uh, that in Brazil. Uh, of course, that you can also come in uh, through, uh, and a foreign investor can also come in through uh, regular M&A &A activity by you know, acquiring a stake in, in a local uh, company. But of course, then uh, I mean, it's a different topic. It's, it's something that uh, you will probably have to worry more about the usual M&A and due diligence complexities, you know, especially in Brazil, thinking about environmental issues, labor, tax, compliance, are all uh, issues that you will have to deal with in the context of acquiring a, a, a stake in a company, and and properly factor that in your uh, you know in your models. Uh, in any, I think in any case, if you are doing business in Brazil, uh, it's very likely that some form of local presence will be required, uh, and and you will. I mean, if you have a, if you if you are a foreign shareholder of a local company, you will need someone to represent you in country uh, before the tax authorities, the central bank, the local company as well needs to have a minimum management. So at least one, one resident officer, again, that can, uh, you know, that, that can answer uh, on behalf of the company uh, to authorities. And as I said before, you know, if you are operating in a, in a regulated sector, uh, there will be um, a number of uh, other uh, requirements uh, to be uh, to be followed, and uh, licenses and authorizations that uh, will be need to obtain. Uh, but this is definitely something to be assessed on a case by case basis. As I mentioned before, uh, I think that all of that uh, is really uh, procedural uh, in most cases. Uh, but it's it's something that takes time, and and you need to properly plan for it including uh, you know, translation and legalization of foreign documents, uh, which I mean, sounds like uh, a very simple task, but again, it, it, may, it may take some time off your schedule. So, so uh, we, we definitely uh, recommend uh, that this is factored into the plans. Uh, you know, uh, not long ago, uh, Brazil became signatory of the uh, Apostille Convention for legalization of documents, which does make some process simpler. But overall, it's still time consuming, especially in, during the pandemic. Uh, we, we've seen uh, in some, some delays uh, and some complexities coming from, from the current uh, situation. You know, uh, any, any other company operating in Brazil will, will also be subject to obtaining a number of uh, um, other minor registrations and, uh, and, and licenses, you know, from 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 the municipal authorities to municipal and state tax authorities, and and again, it will depend on the activity being performed in company in country. Um, so it is when it is when your subsidiary is set up in Brazil that your um, and you have the, the your licenses and registration in place that you can begin operating, uh, you know, trading, entering into contracts, and, and hiring employees. So on that note, uh, employment law is definitely one uh, key uh, topic to, to have in mind. You know, Brazil, Brazil, Brazil has a quite uh, protective uh, employment law system, uh, and there, there are a number of uh, rights assured uh, to employees. And, and, and you have also to observe and, and, and manage properly your relationship with, um, with service providers and, and, and really um, follow the rules uh, in relation to outsourcing, contractual personnel, 
uh, this is definitely an attention point. Uh, to, uh, so, so you can treat contractors and employees, uh, you know, in, in a separate uh, fashion. And they, uh, because I mean, there are a number of benefits and uh, that are exclusive to employees, and you will not want contractors claiming later that they are entitled to those benefits. Uh, this is, for instance, if we were talking about M&A, and, and if, if, we, if you are considering acquiring a company, you know, assessing their, uh, their, their liabilities in relation to, uh, you know, to, to employment law issues uh, is, is, is definitely quite important. Uh, you know, of course, I mean, there are, you know, some flexible arrangements that can be, uh, uh, you know, made in Brazil to hire you know, workforce, uh, you know, temporary contracts are, are permissible, outsourcing, as I said, uh, but all of them uh, subject to, to rules and, and, and regulations. Uh, and, and of course, you know, foreign workers, including directors and officers, they need to obtain a visa before I start working in Brazil. Okay. So the next topic that I wanted to highlight is uh, taxes. Taxes are levied, um, you know, by by the federation, states, and municipalities. Brazil has a very complex system. I don't think we have time to to even uh, touch on on, uh, on on more particularities about the tax system. But it's definitely an attention point and something to have in mind when coming to Brazil. Um, I, I think that. The other point that I wanted to raise is um, environmental environmental liability, environmental laws. Is quite environmental uh, laws are quite comprehensive in Brazil, so you need to understand, you know, your your requirements for licenses, uh, the risks of being uh, exposed to environmental liabilities, uh, how you address that contractually. Although contractually, you're also talking about addressing that between private parties. And, and which has little to do with your exposure before you know, environmental authorities in case of uh, in the environmental damage. And, uh, and, and, and of course, uh, and especially now thinking about the space sector, uh, you know, public procurement, the, the rules about contracting with government uh, are quite important. So you need to, um, to, to have in mind that uh, contracting with the government contracts, they need to be awarded on the basis of transparent competitive selection criteria. You know, there are only very ex uh, limited exceptions uh, to, to that rule. So, so public bids are, are, are the rule and it's very important to, to abide by every formality that, um, that is required in law and in the bid process. Uh, so, so you have to consider, for instance, that you know if it's a, if, if a contra contract is presented in in the context of um, uh, of a public bid, uh, this is the contract that you will be signing. You know there there won't be uh, a lot of room for negotiation. The so so and, and this is particularly re relevant in the space sector, as I said, because it's an area in early development and it, it is definitely. A, a, a process. So uh, you will probably start doing business while government uh, is developing regulation, while the environment is being set up. But I think as we've seen in other cases, in other industries and sectors in Brazil, uh, the, there, is, there is an effort from government to, to, to bring you know, the, the regulatory framework, the environment to uh, closer to what is most attractive to investors and closer to uh, international standards. So, I mean, I think that you know, local local knowledge, the ability to maintain an open dialogue with relevant stakeholders, being prepared to jointly develop value propositions that benefit all parties involved, are extremely important in this case. Investing time, you know, in developing knowledge and relationships in country, obtaining appropriate advice building the right partnerships can significantly assist mitigating risks and potential gaps, especially the ones found, found in incipient uh, regulatory frameworks. So as I mentioned earlier, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have more time to, uh, to, to talk uh, about other to topics, but really, I mean, you know, having in mind, you know, exchange controls, you know, investment structures, 
regulatory matters, tax, labor, environmental law, public procurement are key topics for sure. But there are there are many others which you have in, in, in mind, mm. for instance, like intellectual property. Um, so, so I mean, I think that's 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 all I had uh, for for today in the in, in the limited time we have. Uh, I I really want to thank uh, everyone uh, uh, for your attendance, Kamal, Justine, Talita, Herma for organizing and inviting me to this event. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions on the chat, and you can also get in touch uh, later by email whenever you like. Thank you very much. I, I know it's 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 a very short period of time to handle a very complex conversation. I myself have a yeah. bunch of questions I want to ask you, but uh, in the interest of time, we probably have to pick those up uh, in, indirectly or through email. Sure. Uh, but mm -hmm. thank you very much for being here. And moving straight on to, to get the equivalent perspective um, from a South African point of view, I, I'd like to introduce my, my co-director um, of, of ZA Space, Mr. Davis Cook, um, who uh, has taken some great care to put some content together, which he's going to share with us. Davis, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kamal. Uh, and thank you. It is very encouraging to hear that we, we face both some common challenges and opportunities in doing business um, between Brazil and South Africa, which is certainly some of the things that I, that I heard from the previous speaker. So I kind of want to talk first just a little bit about um, about where South Africa is as a country. And I think this is important because it, it helps to describe both the challenges that we faced and some of the opportunities, particularly around doing business. So currently uh, South Africa has about the third largest economy in Africa um, behind Nigeria and Egypt at 350 billion uh, US dollars. But that has been, been slowing recently and not just you know, due to, to COVID, but certainly over the last four or five years, we've been seeing a contraction. That's, you know, similar to what, what's been happening in, in Brazil, for example. And also in, in, you know, parallel to Brazil is we have this very high um, income inequality. And so there is a, a dramatic difference in the sort of the wealth in, in the country. You know, we're sitting at around 0.6. Um, and there is certainly in South Africa, there's a common kind of jockeying about whether we are more or less unequal than, uh, than Brazil. Um, so, you know, we both share these, these challenges. Um, with around 60 million people, there are 11 official language groups in the country. Um, and so even though, you know, we're quite small population-wise, certainly, we're an incredibly diverse uh, cultural uh, mix here in the country. Um, and, you know, one of the things is that we, we have probably the most diversified economy in Africa. So it's not the largest, as mentioned, Egypt and, and Nigeria are larger, but they're very much oil-based um, countries. So we have the most diversified economy and the most industrialized economy. And that provides some, both opportunities and challenges. And I'll go into this specifically for, for what it means in terms of the space sector. Um, but it means that one on the one hand, it is a very competitive environment. Um, there are many people who are operating in, this, in, in, in the markets, but it also means that there are significant markets and there are access to resources, to people, to skills. And so your ability to compete in these markets um, is really quite high. We remain a very important mineral exporter. Um, so South Africa has you know, significant uh, resources in platinum, in gold, in coal, in uh, a range of new materials that are going to be used um, in sort of the future technologies of the world. So lithium and aluminium and uh, titanium and those kind of technologies or, or minerals. Uh, and so we remain a very important primary industry, um, you know, similar to, to, to Brazil in terms of some of its agricultural products and, you know, things like, um, like iron ore, which is, a, a, you know, you're, you are a, a major producer. The other aspect of South Africa that is quite important is we are a major financial hub uh, and have very, very deep capital markets here in the country. So our stock exchange is uh, you know, far and away the largest in Africa, certainly, uh, and I think 28th or 29th largest in the world. Um, so there is significant financial flows. Uh, the RAND is one of the highest traded emerging market currencies. Um, so there is there's a real strong uh, capital market and access to finance within within the country. 
And that's kind of been supported by this very, very robust legal and institutional framework that we have, and is one of the reasons why um, South Africa is also a major international headquarter uh, geography. So many firms will you know, be based out of South Africa and then operate into the rest of Africa. And so, you know, capital movement in and out of the country um, is very well managed. Um, the legal and judicial systems, particularly around from a corporate and commercial point of view, are very well established. Um, and South Africa has a very, very strong kind of constitutional democracy that enables this to happen. And, you know, of course, there, there are and have been challenges that, you know, we, we all face around the world. Um, but we've seen a very, very strong institutional response to managing this. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why South Africa has maintained its position as this kind of really dominant um, financial and, and corporate headquarters for, for South Africa um, and for, for Africa. So this kind of gives an idea of, of some of the, the high level um, challenges um, and you know, really opportunities that we'd find in the, in the space. But I wanna talk a little bit just about the actual uh, space sector in South Africa. So South Africa really does have a very long standing history and heritage in space. Um, this goes back all the way to the 1960s uh, where we had established satellite tracking stations for a range of deep space probes. Um, and that had been maintained, you know, for, for several decades. Um, and, you know, we have, you know, done quite a bit of work around the development of a range of different satellites. So there has been some, some satellite construction work um, that includes kind of both kind of mid-size down to nano and cube sets in the most recent years. Um, there's been some very strong activity done to support the academic development of, of space-related technologies, whether that's earth observation um, or engineering capabilities. And really in the last uh, 10 years, especially with the establishment of SANS in, in 2011, um, and then ZA Space a couple of years ago, there's really been uh, a formalization of a lot of the space sector in South Africa. And so, you know, when we talk about this growth of the, the sector, it's not just um, independent fragmented activities, but there is real effort being put into building a vibrant space economy. Um, and certainly there's some, some really exciting things that have happened um, in the, the recent past. So for example, there are active conversations around a significant space infrastructure hub, um, which would act as a kind of nexus for, for technology and, and space technology across the country. And, and we can sort of touch on that into, into more detail. Um, but we also need to be honest about um, where we are, um, which is that our sector is small. You know, so if you look at your kind of like global space sector, uh, Africa is, is, you know, the smallest fraction uh, in the pie chart. Now, this has its, its challenges. It means that there is currently not necessarily a significant amount of money being put into this. Um, but what it does mean is from an entrepreneurial and a commercial point of view, we have the biggest opportunity for growth. So can the South African and African space sector grow by 10x or 100x? The answer is yes. We have that ability to significantly expand activities, to expand infrastructure, services, and products in a way that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. You know, we, you know even if we were to triple in size, we would still be smaller than, than Latin America. So from a growth perspective, um, Africa is really the best positioned to, to grow the entire sector. And that attitude and that opportunity is what we are really seeing about um, the business environment here. So, you know, even just in, in the last few weeks, um, we've seen all sorts of, of interest in that, of, and effort going into the role that Africa is playing in the space um, sector. And certainly, you know, these are just four, um, four articles that I've picked up over the last two weeks, um, you know, being really conscious of how do we drive our activity in the sector. So there really is significant growth. And if we look at the budgets that, so that, that uh, you know, governments are spending in this, there is this, this dramatic growth happening. And I think this is just important because it really illustrates that the, 
uh, the entrepreneurial drive and the opportunity to create value in the sector is really at this inflection curve where it's beginning to grow faster than, than most other sectors that we, that we see. So for us, really, space is an incredibly um, rewarding and high potential environment. And that's you know, one of the reasons why we are so excited about this particular engagement with, um, with Brazil, who are facing similar challenges um, and where you, know, you are also in this, this um, kind of hockey stick moment where you're about to, to launch. So the, the last thing that I want to kind of just touch on um, is really talking about the aspirations for, uh, for where we want to go in future. Uh, and this is not just for, um, for the, the private sector, but as a country is really around building a nexus for the development of, of space technologies, whether that's up, mid or downstream. Um, but how do we act as a focal point to build and create this vibrant um, ecosystem. Um, and that necessarily requires not just partnerships within country, but international partnerships and collaborations. Um, you know, space is not uh, constrained by political boundaries. Um, technologies operate, you know, across um, countries uh, and finding ways to work together is really important. And so, as I've mentioned earlier, for example, the Space Infrastructure Hub, which is being considered um, by, um, by, by Sansa, is, is this focal point for how we are able to deliver and create value for all partners um, as, a, as a central nexus. And this is an example of the kind of work that we are um, kind of driving in ZA Space, um, and certainly something that would work to enable a friendlier, more efficient way of doing business um, within the country, um, within the uh, space sector, within South Africa, and certainly acting as a, uh, as a catapult or a launch into the, the rest of the continent. So very happy to take some, some questions. I know that I haven't delved into the details of you know, the uh, complexities of opening a business here, but I think that um, my, my colleague described in principle many of the same challenges that we have um, from, a, from an Okong corporation point of view or a legal point of view. Um, and I really wanted to just touch here on some of the, the opportunities that we see ahead of us um, and why this is such an amazing place for us all to be, to be working. So uh, very happy to answer questions and Kamal and team, very happy to, to hand back to you. Davis, thank you so much. And thank you for introducing the, uh, the Space Infrastructure Hub. I think that's, uh, that's, that's quite a topic of conversation um, and, and potentially to be covered as part of some of the B2Bs that we'll have tomorrow. Um, so at this point, I think if there aren't specific questions for Davis, um, so, so there, there is a question from Motivi. Uh, Motivi, I'm not sure if it's directed to anyone in particular. It might be for Mr. Hush, the previous speaker, uh, to please share the Brazil funding model for the space sector from educational to community projects. If I can ask Ali, if you could respond to that for, for Motivi uh, on the chat, the Q&A chat, that would, be, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we, we're running a little bit behind time, just a few minutes behind time, and we, we have a scheduled break at this point, a leg stretcher a coffee or tea or glass of wine break, uh, depending where you are. Um, if I can ask that we shorten that break and, and still look to getting back at 3.15 South African time and 10.15 Brazilian time, which is literally a few minutes, it's a five minute break, uh, where we'll kick off with the, with the next theme around demystifying space for business. So Herman, if we can pause for the next few minutes and resume, as per schedule, again, South African time, 3.15, if that's okay.
Right, so that was an express break, if ever there was one. Um, I didn't realize how short the break was going to be, but I think in the interest of time, uh, we're going to press on. I certainly hope that everyone is back. Um, so, as I mentioned, we we on to the next theme, which is demystifying space for business. And I think this is a particularly interesting and content-rich part of part of the uh, of the day. Our first speaker was going to be addressing the new space economy and industry is Lihandi Devit, who's a sales and marketing manager at a very exciting business called New Space Systems. Lihandi, welcome. Um, I hope your video is on and the floor is certainly yours. Thank you. Lihandi, I think you're still muted, unfortunately. Unmute myself. Thanks so much, Kamal, and thanks so much for having me. I'm going to quickly just uh, share my video um, with you all, just because I am. Um, I would like to be able to show a video. Uh, so sorry about that. Just give me a second to bring up my PowerPoint. There we go. So you should be seeing my slides right now. So as mentioned by Kamal, I am the sales and marketing manager for a South African company called New Space Systems. We're a tier two supplier of satellite parts. Um, and I've been given the very difficult task to try and condense new space economy and industry into 10 minutes. So it's going to really be just a very brief overview. And I'm going to uh, delineate the discussion um, by really just uh, talking about space to earth landscape. And what I mean by that is really that it's the parts and uh, services that are generated in space for use on earth. So 95% of the estimated 366 billion in revenue generated in 2019 was from the space to earth sector. And so, um, and I think that's also where South Africa and Brazil are predominantly focused. So I think this makes more sense for this discussion, although I do wanna preface by saying, I know that there are a lot of new space actors now looking at going into the space to space landscape. Uh, there are a lot of people like your SpaceX's, uh, Blue Origin, uh, people like Made in Space who are getting a lot of funding to investigate uh, creating products and services for the space to space landscape. But at the moment, it's not really commercially self sustainable and it's very much focused on getting funding from private, um, private actors who want to get a foothold into this industry before it really blows up. So what is the traditional space to earth landscape? Where do we find ourselves? Um, so, I mean, I, I guess given that we just had these speeches about the South African and Brazil uh, landscape, you guys all know that it's it's been predominantly driven by your sort of national space agencies, aerospace and defense corporations uh, for the most part, and it's been defense science and national pride driven. So the funding streams there have been predominantly state sponsored. Um, and then you've had your traditional, your non-traditional space actors. So that's more your universities and in the back rooms of these big corporations doing some CubeSat um, development to try and trial some uh, uh, new technologies and demonstration type missions. Now, this was initially where the uh, new space industry was lumped. Um, so our company, New Space Systems, is fortunately called New Space, but unfortunately was called New Space a couple of years ago, because even just a couple of years ago, traditional space actors really saw the industry as quite kooky. Nobody really knew what was the thing that was New Space. And it was, and even today still, we find a lot of our partners and clients are uh, really struggling to understand how to access this New Space market. So what is new space? Uh, it's broadly led by private actors. And I think the important thing here has been the focus on the operational service orientated mission. So really, we're seeing making use of a lot of constellations to drive that business model. And funding has been both private and public. But I think important here has been this very rapid commercialization of space. It's no longer just uh, government actors or government funded actors operating in the space, but it's a lot of private actors who are now really leading this revolution. So two major factors, it was touched upon, but miniaturization of the technology itself and then the use of rideshare and reusability of rockets. 
So, I mean, we've really seen the size of satellites go down. And then also with things like uh, the bright share opportunities that you have now, Rocket Labs, it's $5 million a launch, uh, which is cheap <laughs> and uh, can be shared among all the right share participants. So really the cost of access to space has come down dramatically. And so it's created this whole new uh, arena for uh, private actors to operate in. And we're seeing for the very first time um, this iterative uh, design and technological advances being applied more rapidly than ever before. Before we had traditional space, which was a big focus on um, reliability and very, very long 25 year lifetimes. So the technology was fairly old, um, but now we have performance being uh, almost as important as in orbit heritage. And of course, we're seeing now this era of constellations. And as you can imagine, much more opportunities for commercially driven um, applications. Uh, I mean, Ale is a Japanese company who you can now contract or or pay to have um, to have a shooting star. So, I mean, just uh, very interesting business models at the moment, and then of course, unprecedented investment. So. According to Seraphim, uh, 8.7 billion invested in 2020 alone. A lot of that going to your larger space, um, new space actors like your SpaceX's and Rocket Labs of the world. Um, but of course, it's also we're seeing a lot of funding going into your smaller players. So in the sort of small sat arena, um, we're seeing people like Sinspective. Um, uh, ISI, a lot of people on the upstream and SAR application, IoT, getting a lot of funding, um, as well as on the CubeSat side of things, uh, constellations such as um, AstroCast, um, Pixel, et cetera, getting significant amounts of funding from both uh, venture capitalists and from uh, government um, actors. So I think it's also important to say here now that, I mean, almost every other day when you look in the news, there's been a large uptake in acquisitions and mergers. So SPAC, uh, which is a special uh, project acquisition companies. Uh, I wanted to actually mention here companies like Redwire, made up of about seven different uh, smaller companies who have now come together and then merged with a SPAC uh, a company to really get to market quicker. And they are now publicly listed as well. And we're seeing a lot of companies go that route. We've seen it with Spy Global. We've seen it with uh, OneWeb. So really a very interesting time in this new space economy. Um, and I think just important to note, a lot of people think new space means CubeSats. Um, but really what it is looking at is everything from sort of um, your 25 kg up to around about 500 kgs. Um, and if you look at this little graph at the bottom here, um, we're seeing a huge uptake in satellites launched per year. So uh, we were averaging at around 500 satellites in the last three preceding years. And then last year, we were at more than 1,200 uh, satellites launched. Of course, OneWeb and um, SpaceX's constellation accounted for almost 900 of that, but still a very, very big increase indeed. So I think what would be good now is just to show you all a very quick case study of what it is to operate in the new space uh, sector, because I think a lot of people really struggle with understanding what it is. Um, and I mean, I'll get to the definition later, but this is showing a partnership that we have with a um, international company um, and just showing how the, the whole new space economy is really working. Next slide. 
Okay, so how are the traditional uh, actors and CubeSat actors trying to get into what is now this new space industry? We're seeing it happening in a lot of different ways, one being funding, funding and contracting of new space actors to try and uh, get them to operate uh, uh, in, this, in the space. So an example of that would be NASA contracting SpaceX to um, do the ISA shuttle trips. Um, and then the adapting of new space philosophy. So trying to really find the balance of, of being commercially competitive, which now means driving down costs like never before, but at the same time, trying to find that balance, balance with high quality, which um, we're finding a lot of our clients are struggling with. Um, and then the other opposite side of that spectrum is of course, a lot of your CubeSat actors are now trying to move more into a new space kind of mind, mindset industry, uh, through funding high reliability CubeSats and improving parts and quality processes. So um, we are seeing that happening. Um, I think before there was this whole idea of just a faster, better, cheaper, getting into market. It's a very famous um, NASA small set philosophy. Um, but I think now more and more as this industry is maturing, we're starting to realize that quality processes are really imperative. And so what we've at New Space have sort of coined as uh, the Goldilocks uh, zone is, you know, looking at operational missions, uh, sort of five to seven year lifetime, still using commercially uh, off the shelf parts, um, high volume manufacturing, but the crux here is really focusing on your international quality standards. So ISO, ESA, NASA, and, and that's effectively what we're doing to try and address um, a lot of the issues that we're seeing in the industry at the moment. Um, we've, we've seen a lot of satellites fail. We've seen a lot of launches fail even just recently, and that's as a result to low quality processes. So um, I think the new space standard is this commercialization of, of space, and, and it's unlocking a lot of very interesting downstream uh, applications, but at the same time, one should not overlook um, the requirement for quality um, standards and processes. And I think um, a lot of our clients are, follow, are struggling to find that balance by being commercially competitive, but not letting the quality get to a point where reliability becomes an issue. I think also important to point out is a lot of people think funding CubeSats is inherently makes them new space. And while CubeSats are there are a lot of CubeSat actors who operate in the new space industry and economy. Uh, that is not the baseline for the actual, what it is to be a new space actor. And so it's very important to understand that at the moment, you've got a lot of new space actors who are actually more operating on the higher end, 100 to 400 kilogram range. It's where you're finding your your space X's, it's where you're finding your OneWebs, it's where you're finding your Black Skies, it's where you're finding ISI and it's Inspective and all the different um, constellate, well, most of the constellations now, barring uh, a couple, as I mentioned, of your more CubeSat um, constellation providers. And then I know I'm over time, so I'm going to just very briefly say, I know that uh, Davis has touched on this and I know, um, I think it's important just to mention that there is this whole South African economy and an industry which has um, sprung up and that has significant amounts of, of expertise and capabilities right across the space value chain. Uh, these are all just the commercial uh, companies which have come up um, in the last couple of years. Uh, given that we don't have a sustained uh, space program in South Africa, I mean, we, we are currently investing in some CubeSat programs um, from the SANSA perspective. But other than that, all of the companies you see, especially on the upstream, are effectively 95% exports. So South Africa has significant amounts of, of know-how and, and capabilities. And so I think that there is a lot of scope for partnership with Brazilian companies and, and industry, and that they, that could be a very uh, um, uh, mutually beneficial um, engagement. So I'm very excited about this uh, summit and would like to thank everyone so much for including me and for uh, ZA Space for, for um, making this possible. 
Um, that was lightning speed, and I'm sorry my uh, speaking also sped up as I went along. If you have questions, feel free to send uh, them in the QA chat or um, link up with me via our website, social medias. Um, I've also added my email there as well. So thank you so much. Fantastic, Leandi, and thank you. you. You've done a phenomenal job. I love that last slide, but, but trying to, to, to plot the industry together. I think it's taking shape. Long way to go, as Davis indicated, we're still small. But thank you for those insights. Uh, and if there are specific questions, please put them on the chat or uh, send it, send it to, to the speakers uh, by email, which they will share. So moving on and, and, and talking about the benefits of space on economy and society is Mr. Antonio Ueta. Uh, he's an organizing com committee member for the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil. Antonio, welcome. Uh, looking forward to hearing your insights. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to share my uh, presentation with you guys. Can you can you see my presentation? Yes, thank you. Okay. So then, uh, um, well, um, uh, thank you for having me here uh, to talk about the benefits of space uh, on uh, economy and society. Uh, before uh, I started to talk about uh, the, uh, the benefits uh, to, uh, of space to humanity, I'd like to say a few words considering a perspective of uh, uh, futures. It's important to remind uh, that the space-related field since its beginning has been driven by uh, the futuristic vision. Now, uh, if we want to, to uh, yeah, yeah, if we want to um, uh, think of uh, global challenges for the future, we perceive that uh, overpopulation is an important driving force because it affects all the concerns. In other words, more people on the planet indicate more demand for food, water, housing energy, health, uh, transportation, etc. Uh, you probably interested in seeing the space industries uh, solutions to these issues to help improve people's lives, uh, especially in the next 30 years. We will present, sorry, I will, I will present a few examples of uh, uh, space applications uh, of um, the benefits of uh, space applications coming from these four types of uh, 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 satellites. But it's clear that the list is much longer than that. Uh, here we see uh, a, a mosaic of Brazil assembled with the uh, images of the Cibers 2 uh, CCD camera. This mosaic here is at the uh, left. Uh, has about 1,000 images with a spatial resolution of 900 meters. Uh, we can see the Amazon rainforest in green and the other uh, regions of the country as well. Now, if we uh, want to observe more details of the plantation, then we have to choose the satellite sensors with uh, lower spatial resolution. That's right. We see a, a Sentinel-2 satellite image showing a part of the wheat uh, belt in Australia. Uh, mega constellations of nanosatellites uh, with even lower spatial resolution have been used to, to help producer optimize uh, their crops. Uh, remote sensing satellites uh, can be uh, used, for instance, uh, for, um, let's see here, uh, they, they carry payloads that provide information about sea surface temperature, um, uh, ocean topography, nutrient levels, and so on. Uh, and at left, we see that this information can be used to, to help pinpoint optimal uh, locations for aquaculture, including mussel farms, salmon farms, and seaweed farms. 
uh, agrees uh, if all uh, at right twin uh, satellites follow each other in uh, around the Earth. Uh, the uh, various information from uh, the satellites can be used to construct monthly maps of Earth's average gravity fields, offering details of how water is moving around the planet. Another uh, uh, application of remote sensing satellites is the uh, forest fire detection. Uh, and we see, uh, we can see satellite images of wildfires in California and in Pantanal wetland in Brazil. Uh, it goes uh, without saying that the financial uh, impact left by wildfires can be massive. Um, it left uh, 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 the ghost satellite image of a hurricane Laura in the southern United States. Through images like this, uh, local authorities can draw up plans to rescue the population affected by hurricanes. Uh, natural disasters such as floods, hurricanes, typhoons, and earthquakes can result in loss of properties, lives, crop failure, spread of disease, etc. Satellites are important to assist in decision making in the uh, event of natural disasters due to, uh, to their uh, ubiquitous uh, characteristics. Uh, left, uh, we see that uh, communication uh, satellites can be used to provide continuing education programs to students and professionals in rural and remote areas, or it can be used to increase uh, health uh, service connectivity in remote areas in developing countries, mainly for consultation or monitoring purposes. Telecom sets uh, are being very important during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in general, um, um, farms occupy large areas in rural zones and often the infrastructure needed to bring broadband internet to those areas is not available. To solve this connectivity problem, satellites can be used to, uh, due to their ubiquitous coverage. Connectivity is expected to improve even more when mega constellations of small satellites will be fully operational at higher frequencies in the near future. Uh, GNSS are used in all forms of transportation. Uh, these four pictures uh, show the GPS being used in airplane, car, drone control, and RTK system. Uh, GPS tracking uh, devices enable uh, locating the animals remotely with the help of GPS tracking collars uh, to help an animal in need. Um, uh, navigate, uh, precision agriculture uh, has a powerful tool combining remote sensing satellites, GNS, EST, and CONSAT. It provides data needed for uh, improving land and uh, water use, helping maximize efficiency and reduce cost. Uh, William Hollow discusses the seven forecasts uh, that fo follow outline in our progress towards the uh, final frontier. Several efforts are expected to trigger a boom in commercial space development in about 2025. It is estimated that the, uh, this expansion could create a worldwide uh, space industry with uh, revenues of around $1 trillion a year. Uh, last year, uh, China uh, launched the uh, world's first 6G test satellite. It is the first uh, technical verification of terahertz communication in a space application scenario. And a few weeks ago, Chinese giant Huawei reported that its 6G networks will be launched in 2030. Uh, ESA, uh, uh, right, ESA announced that in 2025, the first active debris uh, removal mission, clear space, we, uh, will uh, rendezvous 
capture and take down for re-entry the upper part of Vespa from Europeans uh, uh, Vega launcher. And uh, we can briefly uh, conclude that the satellites are beneficial to a country's economy and society leveraging uh, businesses in various areas, such as navigation, agribusiness, television, meteorology, business and finance, climate and environmental uh, monitoring, etc. Well, uh, here are my contacts. Uh, I, will I will be delighted to interact with all of you on this subject mainly to inspire young people to think about possible and preferable futures and help transform people's lives in Brazil and South Africa through space technology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, again, if there are any specific questions, please put them on the chat uh, if, if you can. Um, I, I think the, 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 the topic is incredibly powerful, particularly for developing countries like ourselves, uh, where both countries have accepted that space is a fundamental area of investment of growth. Uh, the space infrastructure hub that we touched on briefly is, is, is indicative of what South Africa is trying to do. So thank you for that. Our next speaker, I'm very proud to say, is not from a space agency, he's from a bank, one of the largest banks in our country. Uh, I'm a great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Mike Sage, the Chief Executive Officer of Structured Finance Solutions at First National Bank in South Africa. And he's gonna to speak to us about how to integrate space into economy and society. Mike, welcome. Thank you for being here uh, and looking forward to your, to your inputs. Over to you. You're on mute, mute though. I'm muted on. now. Can you hear me? Thank you so much and uh, thank you all today for the opportunity to be with you. It is uh, such an honor to be part of this very important and invigorating work. Um, as mentioned, my name is Mike Sage. I'm a banker in South Africa and uh, very much involved in job creation through the emancipation of medium sized or small to medium sized businesses in Southern Africa. As a bank, we are very focused in helping to develop digital and technology tools as well as funding mechanisms to support this purpose. Uh, from my perspective, uh, the human project will forever be changed by access to technology and innovation and space exploration is driving and leading this change. Uh, for us as a business, the rate of change brought on by the COVID pandemic has quickened this journey and some of what we hope to achieve in the next 10 years has in fact been accomplished in the last 12 months. Therefore, for us as a bank, the ability to harness this amazing technology particularly space technology and digital enhancement is rightfully front and center of our strategic intent. What has become abundantly clear is that we cannot do this alone. Previously, for various reasons, we had preferred to go it alone. Uh, we now assess that each particular initiative must be considered at each juncture, whether we build ourselves, whether we buy or whether we partner. I have a daughter who just finished school and one of the passions we both share is for music and it helps to bridge our generational divide. One of the genres she likes to listen to are collabs. Dad, have you heard the latest collab? It turns out that the music collaboration in various forms has defined the music of her generation. For me, the take off from this in order to expedite the integration of space and space tech into the mainstream economy, we need to develop deep collaboration. We need to be open to sharing ideas, access to platforms, and to create a successful future. For us as a service provider, our abilities lie mainly in access to capital, risk, and advisory services, and these need continual enhancement and innovation. I'd like to share with you a few examples where I believe this collaboration could become deeper. We are the biggest lender in Southern Africa in the agricultural sector. The sector is heavily weather dependent, but mainly around access to water. Quality earth observation data will enhance our ability to provide risk mitigated capital to new and existing work streams like never before. We're now starting to assess how we can use this data from space satellites, as well as data from unmanned aircraft like drones, 
and hope to co combine this data to provide use cases for enhanced production, enhanced crop yields, increasing lending practices, and overall enhance our customer experience. Another area we're heavily involved is trade. The evolution of the global economic system is arguably one of the most important developments of the last 100 years. Love it or loathe it, globalization has given rise to significant growth in trade between countries and international trade has been the key driver of economic growth for the vast majority of countries across the globe. The focus therefore needs to be on driving South Africa's export strategy to establish new markets and steadily raise foreign revenue reserves. A focused industry specific approach is vital and should be prioritized through digitization, transparency, and open opportunity to businesses. We do provide an end to end import and export logistics platform called Trade360. Trade and this platform relies heavily on satellite technology to enhance delivery accuracy, reduce costs of delivery, and finance and enhance our client experience. We need to combine global information systems and earth observation capabilities into those products and services so that local companies can target much larger global markets for exports. For us as a business, our entire platform and branch network relies heavily on telecommunication and internet access. The larger the reach of access to the internet will fundamentally change how we do business on the continent and again, our overall client experience. As it turns out, one of the biggest long-term threats to our society and business is climate change as mentioned by previous speakers. So in fact, our destiny is intertwined with all of yours. We know that climate is changing at an unprecedented rate and the ability of space ecosystem to extract data required to support strategic decisions needed to affect change for the long-term sustainability of the planet just show how dependent we are on the space industry. For South Africa's space agency conjunction with, the, with ZAR Space, as mentioned before, have conducted an industry review in the space infrastructure hub and how best we can engage with a broad range of stakeholders to create a sustainable local space industry. For me, this report highlights some key recommendations and collaborations we need to consider, such as we need to showcase South Africa's geospatial readiness to the world, we need to prioritize vertical integration with the private sector. We need to leverage the country's favorable geography for launching and tracking satellites that attract global in investors and grow local SMEs. We need to invest in local supply chains that go beyond space technology. We need access to funding to help develop local SMMEs. And we need to assist to close the gap between raw data and processed earth observation data in South Africa. With regards to integrating space and society, I firmly believe that the new era of SpaceX and many of the others mentioned earlier today, including the International Space Station have captured the minds of the youth. The thought that maybe one day flying to stay on the moon or an outpost on Mars has become an almost believable proposition. The new frontier of space exploration, a multi-planetarian human project, and the exponential growth of deep data analysis is at the cutting edge of societal development. The key to executing on this will be the purpose of how to collaborate with the power of government vision combined with the power of the private sector collaboration to create a platform that not only helps achieve regionalized growth acceleration, but job creation, and job creation, but intercontinental collaboration in the pursuit of attaining the World Bank's sustainable development goals. I thank you very much for your time and I look forward to some of the questions that might be on the chat. Thank you very much for the time. Mike, thank you. Thank you for your time and, and, and the insights that you shared. I think uh, linking the space infrastructure hub and the focus on geospatial readiness is critical for us, I think, as a continent. And I'm sure it's, a, it's an imperative shared but the South American continent, and Brazil in particular, is, is one of the bigger economies. So thank you for your time. If there are any questions for Mike, please put them on the, on the chat, the Q&A chat, um, and we will address them. I think his, his email details are, uh, are also available. Excellent. So, so we're moving on, and, and the next topic is, is, is 
linked very much to, to what Mike started talking about in finance for space, obstacles and opportunities. We have Mr. Mr. William Ospendowski, Deputy Head of Innovation from the Brazilian Innovation Funding Agency. I have no doubt there's a lot of interest in what you're going to be talking about. Uh, so over to you. Thank you, man. Thank you very much, Mr. Camo. It's a pleasure to be here speaking to this brilliant and bright audience from Brazil and South Africa. I had the pleasure of visiting South Africa three years ago when I was attending an event in the IDC, Industrial Development Corporation, to present my dissertation on finance for innovation. So it's really good to be in touch with you. Unfortunately, not presentially, but uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to answer any questions and doubts. So let me first of all uh, share my presentation here. I'll try to be brief since our time is very short. And uh, so the objective here is to present FNAP's role in terms of support in the space sector. And uh, first of all, uh, FNAP is a, is a state-owned agency. It has been found, founded more than 50 years ago. So uh, it, it, it is related to the Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation. So our minister, for the ones who know, is a former astronaut. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be working with him. He was the first and only Brazilian astronaut, a very smart person, a very intelligent person, and he's conducting our ministry. And uh, as he says, uh, the ministry is a tool for society, so just such as FNAP, for all the sectors to try to uh, be more innovative and reaching companies, startups, and uh, institutional agencies or also to, to increase. So as I'm going to present to you in the next slides, FNAP is a very comprehensive agency it reaches all the spectrum of the innovation uh, cycle, STI cycle. So since TRL one to nine, so I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this uh, metrics. Uh, it's, it's, it has been uh, created by NAS in the space sector to talk about the maturity rate. So we can fund even very basic research uh, uh, developments such as universities, labs and, and infrastructure, technological parks, all this uh, innovation habitats, FNAP has been having a very important role in this more than 50 years of operating. We also fund many startups and uh, new companies and also large corporations when it comes to innovation and reaching the market. So for us, innovation is when it reaches the market and it sells. And we're also very interested in, in the public sector innovation. So uh, working with other ministries and agencies such as the National uh, Space Agency, which we have a very interesting cooperation. Uh, well, the presentation is going to be shared and anyone can also mail me, so I'm not going to be that much here in, in details, but the fact is that we have many products and uh, we can go as small as $10,000 as our, our minimum support for uh, uh, initializing companies and also up to $100 million for big companies such as Embraer, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with, which is the Brazilian aeronautic uh, uh, company. And uh, we have uh, all the types of instruments that an uh, innovation agency like TIA in South Africa, I had the pleasure to visit the Technology Innovation Agency, which is a, a sister company of FNAP South Africa or, or any other development bank as a, the IGC or BNDS in Brazil. We go from grants uh, with non-refundable uh, resources, equity, direct or indirect, so we can invest through funds. And we also have uh, concessional loans with uh, long-term loans can be up to 20 years in some cases, because we know that uh, any action regarding a uh, very complex technology, we're talking about deep tech here because uh, many people are seeing uh, startups in the media, in the social uh, media area, but when it comes to space, we know it's a very complex uh, endeavor. So it's good to have the right type of finance for this uh, specific development. And I am very proud to show here the, the large broad of cooperation that FNAP has with uh, many other agencies and institutions in different countries around the world. And uh, I would like to focus on two specific cases. We have a very interesting cooperation with Sweden. Uh, we know it's, uh, it's an innovation agency. We have some projects uh, with Embraer and uh, our institu technological institution of aeronautics from the Brazilian Air Force. We have an interesting cooperation with them in this area. And I would also like to highlight uh, it was not a direct cooperation, but we helped the development of the ADART missile, which is in the, it was in the interest of the Brazilian Air Force. And I, I'm very proud to say that there was a cooperation not only between two countries, but also between institutions 
uh, technology institutions and companies. We know that sometimes it's difficult to merge and to relate all this uh, triple helix of governments, companies, and also uh, scientific institution. And in this case, it worked very well. So we had uh, the National, the, the Technological Institute of Aeronautics from the Brazilian Air Force. We had Avibras, we had Opto, uh, which is going to be presented here afterwards uh, in the Akaya group. And uh, of course, Denel Dynamics in the South African side and the missile is going uh, very well. Uh, and I, I, will also, I would like also to bring here uh, our more recent cooperation in terms of the space sector. Um, I'm very proud to be working with this since the beginning. So uh, we, it all started uh, when Brazilian national government decided to purchase a very big uh, a geostationary defense and strategic communication satellite. Uh, because, you know, Brazil is a very big uh, territory. We have uh, places where internet connection is complex. We have the army working in this border, which is huge. So you have to have a very good infrastructure uh, to be operating. So uh, Brazil decided to, to buy this. But it's, as we know, uh, every time the country tries to purchase a very complex high-tech uh, 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 equipment, like uh, jet planes or satellites, we try to have some kind of offset. So uh, the, the, the deal was in terms that uh, the Brazilian national companies could learn a little bit with the provider of this equipment, which is the Thales Alene Space, based in the south of France. So we had the pleasure of sending engineers from Brazil, not only from these companies, but also from the Air Force and also from the National uh, uh, Airspace, uh, National Space Agency. So they, they went there and FINEP was the agency that selected these six companies uh, in terms of the companies that they were strong enough to be able to learn because you cannot create a company and learn how to do like a thrust system, a control system or lens. So all these companies here, I'm very proud to be in touch with. I know all the founders and the executives. So uh, just to mention one of them, Opto Space and Defense, which is part of the Alcair Group, was founded in 1985 and FINEP has been founding this company for many, many years. And they're developing satellite lanes, which is a uh, very high tech. Uh, equipment, and uh, I, I'm sure FNAP will help them also to to uh, upgrade their capacity. And the National Space Agency, Mr. Moore is a very good friend of us, a very uh, a smart person who was, is cooperating with us, and uh, I'm really happy to be in touch with, with them. Uh, another thing that is important to mention is that we have to be sure that uh, any uh, complex investment takes a lot of time to mature and there's a big amount of risk involved. So unfortunately we have, for instance, accidents before, but we have never stopped trying and developing new tools and features. So uh, at this beginning of this year, when the satellite Amazon One was launched in India, we were really happy and proud to see this, this conquer of a Brazilian technology. And uh, I'm sure that uh, the components of it, most of them were developed by companies that have been part of FNAP's uh, support for the for the last 10 or 20 years so uh, it's interesting that it pays off so uh, uh, I like the other slide that was presented the different of the market size when you compare the space markets in, in in the US or in Europe when it comes to Latin America and Africa it's still small but it can grow and we have to be targeting the next five to ten years so uh, I think we should not lose track on this and obviously we're trying to learn and be in touch with the new trends and in this, in, this, in this specific point here, it's important to mention that uh, both our ministry and FINEP, we are a tool. So we're not the, the, the experts in the area. The experts are the National Space Agency, the Air Force, the National uh, Institute for Space Research, INPE, which is also featured here. So we try to learn from them and try to consolidate a public policy that goes in the same direction because we don't have a lot of resources. So it's important that uh, our national space program has, has a, constructed a focus. So in, the, in this specific time, there is a review of, of the PNAI, which is a national plan for the space sector. And I'm really sure that this is be, being very well conducted by the National Space Agency. And we, we want to work with them uh, towards new areas of, of space uh, uh, technology. And uh, just to finish and summarize here, uh, I was asked to talk about obstacles and opportunities regarding finance in the space sector. And it's interesting to realize that most of the obstacles that we've been talking about for the last five or 10 years, uh, we have a, a good chances of overcoming them in, in terms of new uh, uh, actions that are happening 
very recently. So for instance, we have been suffering a lot with the instability of resources, especially grants for the space sector and companies. And uh, just the beginning of the year, we have a new law that uh, is going to, to, to be able to use our National Science and Development Fund to its fullest because uh, we could use the, the total amount of it and it's up to $1 billion every year. So we can do a support for many projects with it. And also it's important to mix and to tap the opportunities of research and also purchasing. So uh, it's important that we fund companies that are in the end selling it, their services or products to uh, governmental agencies. And now as we have also private actors work in this area, we have more opportunities of not depending only to government purchasing. And uh, we are being more focused as I mentioned before. And I'd like to finish with one very important aspect that I'm, I'm very concerned of is that when we talk about old space or new space, of, of course, we're going towards new space, but even new space, if you think about Tesla, for instance, Elon Musk is always being great in, uh, grateful for NASA. So it's important that the public sector agencies, such as the National Space Agency or even FNAP, that they don't disappear from the map, that they help, that they put the sector, the focus, and also use smart money. So for instance, we, 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 we fund startups, but we put public money and we require that angel investors and other private investors go, come together. So uh, just to, to finish, I think it's a very important area for space sector. And as a, a Brazilian uh, innovation agency, we want to work together with new private investors, with new private manufacturers, so that our country uh, can reach uh, more, more success in this area. So uh, finally, thank you very much. My contact, uh, WhatsApp and email is here, and I'm, I'm really happy to be in touch with everyone. William, thank you so much for that. I think that's that's that was incredibly insightful. Um, I see there's a there is a question on the Q and A chat group, um, but I think it's been answered. Does FNAP only invest in private sector or public, such as university extension groups? Uh, there's reference made to a program called CT Infra for for universities. Um, so, if there are any other questions for William, please add them onto the on the Q and A group. Um, and we can we can try and add some some detail to it. Thank you, William. Um, Thank you. We, we, we've coming just to the last bit of our program for today, and it's it's really a warm up for tomorrow, if if nothing else. It's an opportunity to meet two of the organizations from each of the countries, each of Brazil and South Africa, um, and and we're going to be calling it referring to it as company introductions. It's a great opportunity to just get a sense of. Um, the businesses that that uh, are here today, and we would have loved to represent everyone. But in the in the interest of time, we we, we picked four: one from upstream, one from downstream, etc. And the first one is Dr. Cesar Gizoni, Executive Director of Equatorial Systems at the AK Group. Uh, Dr. Cesar, welcome. Okay, um, and thanks. The stage is yours. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Kamal. Thank you, the sponsors. Brazilian Space Agents, uh, South Africa Agents, uh, and uh, especially Parque Tecnológico San José that we are located. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to present our main uh, heritage in space. I will be much more concentrated on what we have done. Okay, so we can now figure out what the future could be. Okay, uh, I will share my presentation okay well uh, company we are a medium-sized company no and uh, that uh, constitute a career group it's about 500 employees. We are mainly, we are a Brazilian company, but we have a, a strong partner, a strong shareholder like Saab, but the company is completely Brazilian. So we are always a strategic defense company. And Saab joined AKR Group in the, the framework of the Gritten project. No? AKR is the main, Brazilian partner for developing the Gripen uh, fighter. The, uh, we, uh, we have about uh, 
four companies, mainly four companies under the same group led by our president, uh, coincidentally Cesar, also Cesar. We have Equatorial from right to left, Opto, Troia, Troia is a tool and uh, auto, automa automation company, and then Acaer Engineering, that was the original company uh, that uh, uh, creates the, the group, okay? So this is our office in San Jose. We have a, a, a quite large uh, headquarters, about 20,000 uh, square meters. Uh, with many, a lot of facilities for aeronautics, for uh, metrology, electronics, uh, testing laboratories, energy. We have one of the, uh, the unique uh, laboratories in Brazil and the, I guess South America to test uh, engines and the propulsion system in the closed loop form, closed loop. In São Carlos, where is Opto is, Opto is a, 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 our optronic company of the group. Mm -hmm. Do we have the full uh, work, uh, workshop for, uh, for optical manufacturing with very precision ma machinery? All testing, characterizing, and mechanical shop, besides some clean rooms for integration and test of optics. Okay. Uh, the main areas that uh, Acaer Group uh, works on is originally aeronautics. We have a very strong uh, heritage in aeronautics. Uh, the company was uh, created under uh, contract with Embraer, was, has been a, a very uh, strong partner from Embraer since the beginning. Of course, in space also, especially we both uh, three companies from the group, Acaer, Engineering, Opto, and the Equatorial, all have uh, origin in space. We, we work on mission definition, optical payload, system integration, okay. defense, and the industry. Okay, We are concentrated here in, in just the space. Here is our timeline of the uh, space-related achievements. No? The companies, they were created. Uh, Opto was a, a little older, 1985. A Caer Engineering here, Caer Engineering, is 1992. And Equatorial, 1996. Equatorial was created just to work for for the Brazilian Space Program. We we got a contract, the first Brazilian contract on space. No? I mean, the first one was for a Caer. On the, the this is a launching launching site launching facility in Al Alcântara, a Caer was uh, contracted to, to design the, the launching, uh, launching uh, facility. And then uh, for Cibers, the uh, Cibers is a China-Brazil Earth Resource Satellite. The first one, one, two, and two B, Equatorial was uh, responsible and developed the, the first uh, optical camera for satellite. It's a small camera, but a very wide field. And Acaer was contracted for the, the structure, mechanical structure. Okay. Then uh, we come down uh, in uh, we have also worked for a for a satellite, uh, a NASA Aqua satellite, where Brazil was uh, was participating, and uh, we were contracted to to manufacture and develop part of the humidity sound. It was a uh, former MSUB. It was a, a sounder to to monitor the humidity of the atmosphere. No? Mm -hmm. And uh, then later on, we designed the Sibers mission, the new Sibers mission, all the analysis and the former pre-phase phase A was developed by Equatorial, and then came Sibers 3 and 4 later on, then Opto came into the, into the scene with the camera, more sophisticated camera, three, 3 and 4, and the equatorial with uh, WFI, then DDR, and then, I mean, I, I can. Then later on, in, in 2016, uh, Opto was acquired by ACAE, and 2017, equatorial. And then from there on, we 
we are together as a group and uh, we refurbished completely the WFI from Cibers to Amazon One. We, we, we requalified and adapted you know, for Amazon One, also the, <clears throat> the data recorder. And later on, now Opto is working in, in an optical payload, it's finished for, for a cube, uh, V cube satellite from Vision. Okay. Well, here we, we participate in all the Brazilian space programs since the beginning. Here is the WFI uh, optical head. Here is the WFI for 1991, 92. The humidity sounder, this side. The Opto Space and Defense that has full capability to design, develop, manufacture. Uh, opt precision optical instruments. You know? It has a uh, fine mechanism, everything in in house. Uh, here is one uh, one of the objective. This is the main objective for the Sibers uh, twenty meter resolution camera. It's called MOU M A M O E X for multi spectral. And uh, here we have some uh, images. We have a Cibers 3 and 4 multispectral camera that was designed and manufactured by Opto. And it's operational since 2015. It has 20 meters ground uh, uh, resolution and a SWAT of 120 kilometers. And also flying in the same satellite, a wide field imager. That's a resolution of 60 four meters and the ground south of around 900 kilometers. That's especially designed for the Amazon environmental monitoring. For the, uh, this is the Amazon One. We have uh, on board of Amazon One is the digital data recorder and one WFI that was designed originally for, uh, for CBS, for the China Brazil. Also in, in this is the most recent. That's a 3U nanosat camera, no? especially designed for a 6U satellite from, from the customer vision. It has four spectral bands, no? uh, red, green, near infrared, and red edge, with a ground resolution 3.5 meters at 500 kilometers orbital, SWAT 14.5. We use a TDI sensor to, to improve the signal to noise ratio. It has a mass of four kilos and 15 watts. Uh, it, it's in final testing phase, you know, the, the, F, the flight model is already manufactured and we are just making the acceptance test it should be delivered. It's a kind of sophisticated camera, you no, know, because uh, the, the, the specification requirements are were tight in terms of uh, radiometric resolution, the quality of the images. Uh, here is our roadmap no, to, to get to a very high resolution satellite, submet. We have designed in the past all these cameras for low and medium resolution. Now we have this uh, G about three meter resolution for a uh, 6U. Next, we are prepared to, for a, a constellation of high resolution, 1.5 meters. It's not contracted yet, but we, are, we have uh, had some funding project just to design the mission from FAPESP and FINET. And uh, this is our aim, the goal for, for future to have, uh, using all this heritage to get to a, a Submetric resolution. Here is some of our uh, capabilities that we do a mission analysis and design, complete mission, space vehicle architecture, technical budgets, and so. And two of the main engineering that we are uh, very traditional here is the thermal analysis and design, active and passive, and uh, uh, radiation analysis using Monte Carlo simulation. We do total radiation dose and single events effect. That's all for the time that uh, I had. I, I thank you.
And, uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Cesar. Um, that, that was very informative and, uh, and I'm sure it's, it's, it's created interest in, for, for people to reach out to you in the course of the B2B sessions. Thank you, thank okay. you very much. For um, uh, our second Brazilian uh, company to be profiled is uh, going to be led by Mr. Himokon Carvalho, CTO of Vision A. Um, so you, you, is, your, is your screen ready to be shared? There you go, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the next few minutes. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here in this meeting and a very good opportunity to introduce our company. I thank you very much. And now I'll share the presentation. See. Can you see? Yes, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so let's start introducing the company. Visiona was created in 2012 uh, when Brazil decided to, uh, to have its own geostationary satellite cited by FINEP, by the way. And Visione was selected as the prime contractor responsible for procuring the satellite, the, the ground systems, and uh, the launch services, being responsible for the specification and all uh, mission level uh, engineering and, and, and specification. Uh, it was about 2013 when it was uh, Visione was created and, and the project started. And in 2017, the project was delivered. The satellite was launched by uh, an Ariane space from Guyana and it's working. And the satellite was delivered on time and on budget. Uh, the main purpose of the satellite was, uh, was threefold. Um, uh, first of all, the, to support the national broadband plan to, to provide services, to, uh, or to provide internet, fast internet all over the Brazilian territory, mainly th those uh, remote areas, <clears throat> to provide secure communications for, for defense, and finally to acquire critical technologies. One of the, these programs were also uh, shown by uh, FINEP uh, at the FINEP presentation. And from this, uh, uh, from this project, we gathered uh, some competencies and, and today we are able to, to work on a whole range of space uh, activities from mission analysis to systems and satellite engineering, ground segment definition, launch support and, and, and launch campaigns, space operations and, and the space applications. And also from uh, that time, we decided to develop our own technology in-house so that we'll, we would be able to, to build our own satellites, mainly for the Brazilian space program. And that's what's, what happened. And we are in the final steps of the development of our, our VCUB satellite. It's a 6U satellite, a very small satellite, like a true box, and 12 kilograms. It, uh, it has, a, as at the payload, a camera. It was just shown by, by Gizoni, the, the, the camera from Opto, a uh, It's a 3.5 meter resolution camera with four bands. And, and these, these four bands are divided in, in, in four different uh, CCD, uh, uh, CCD stacks. And to develop this satellite, uh, we decided to develop in-house the attitude and orbit control subsystem from scratch. So the, the, the project started in, in 2014 and finished in 2018. Also, the, the whole uh, overall 
uh, onboard uh, data handling system, the, the overall onboard software, and also the ground software that talks to the onboard software, there's the ground control software. And as a, a, another payload besides the camera, we decided that software defined radios were a very interesting area to, 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 to work with because of the flexibility, because of the, uh, uh, it may be reconfigurable on the flight. So we decided to add a, a software defined radio inside the satellite to make a data collecting mission where the data to be collected will be uh, a, a data from hydrometeorological platforms installed all over Brazil by the government. And we, and they have an open architecture and, and uh, uh, we know the, with the frequencies and everything. So we can uh, work relaying the data from these platforms to uh, a central station and aiding the, the, the Brazilian government in their mission to, to provide hydrometeorological data for the complete uh, territory. Um, I have bor uh, borrowed the, 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 the photos from, from Gizoni. Here's the camera. And it, it's part of the, uh, the 3U of the satellite. So 3Us are, are devoted to, to the camera and the other 3Us to the, to the platform uh, where the, the whole onboard software is made by Visiona and subsystems are, are purchased on, in, in the space market. So here's the, the photo of the FlatSat. We are working on, on the FlatSat today, but we have received most of the flight equipment and we intend to start the, uh, the AIT phase uh, by next month. So in June, it will take until September where we, we will have the, the acceptance review of the satellite and we will be ready for launch by the end of the year. In, in, uh, as of today, we are in the middle of the RFP for the launch services for this satellite. So besides uh, uh, satellite uh, technology, Vision also, uh, uh, oh, before that, uh, we, the idea here for the future, once the satellite uh, works and everything, uh, the idea is that with a, a small constellation of, for instance, nine satellites, we can cover the whole Brazilian territory in 20 days for a systematic uh, uh, co uh, coverage, but also we can access the complete territory within one day by deploying the satellites. So that's what you see for the future of, uh, of uh, VCAP. Okay, besides the satellites, Visiona works uh, in, in remote sensing services. We, we have uh, contracts with most uh, remote sensing providers, and we have access to a whole range of satellites with, uh, from optical to radar, and ranging for 30 centimeters to, to 20, 20 meters of resolution on, on the optical side and same for a radar. Besides the, the, this, uh, this access to that uh, constellation of satellites, uh, Visiona operates an airplane that holds a, a dual band, X band and P band radar so we, we are able to, to provide radar imagery in both bands. Um, for the X band, for instance, is very good to, 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 to image the canopy of, of, of the trees and, 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 and to detect metals all, all, uh, below the trees. And for the P band, it goes through the canopy and goes up to the ground. So we can even uh, uh, do cartography uh, in, in forest regions. And as a byproduct, uh, uh, subtract, subtracting the both informations from X band over the canopy from, and from P band down to the ground, we can estimate the biomass in between. 
So we can estimate the amount of trees and, and, and biomass in between either to protect or to exploit intelligently. So uh, this provides us with a whole range of, of applications from or imagery to topographic maps. And uh, last but not least, we, devote, uh, we developed a, a web platform. We call that WebVis platform, where a user uh, can enter and access this whole range, this fleet of uh, imagery satellites can access all the, uh, the images available in their, in their catalogs and even uh, making plans for, for data acquisition through the web and uh, apply algorithms that are already uh, stored in the cloud. And it, here is this, uh, a kind of example of uh, seeing the history of, uh, a, uh, of a, a selected area where we can uh, see the history and super, superimposing several images from uh, through time and make, for instance, uh, change detections as uh, one of the, the, the applications. Other applications uh, here and, and other algorithms uh, provide applications for agriculture, for defense, and, 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 and for urban uh, planning. So that's the, the, uh, the overview of our company. I, I hope I, I, I have stick to, to the time. And I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Imokan, for preparing that and sharing that with such passion. Um, I, I think it's um, a great collection of services that are sitting within, within your organization and, and you're bound to, to create lots of excitement with the, with, the, with the audience that we have. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So we are running a little behind, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if, we can, if I can ask you to just hang in there. Um, we have two organizations, two ladies, I might add, uh, who are going to share with us their, their, their businesses. The first is uh, Jesse Ndaba, who is a co-founder and managing director of Astrophica. Uh, Jesse, welcome, uh, and thank you for, for, for being here. Looking forward to, to hearing about what Astrophica are up to. Hi, thank you so much, Kamal. Thank you so much for successfully arranging this and for inviting us, Astrophica truly appreciates the opportunity. Um, I also got a chance to meet um, old friends um, that I went to school with, Antonio um, Yuki. I know him from back then when I was at the International Space University. So yeah, um, just seeing them um, makes me feel like, yo, I, I'm, 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 I'm home. Um, thank you so much again, Kamal. Um, trying to share. Can you see my screen? Okay, I'll take it. You can see it. Um, my name is yes, Jessie. Yes, Jessie. Thanks, Kamal. My name is Jessie Ndaba. I'm the CEO with Astrophical Technologies. Um, actually, when Davis was talking, it sort of felt like he was just introducing us as Astrophica because he, he, he spoke of the rich history of South Africa and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm, 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 I'm a pure product of, of that rich history of South Africa. Even though my partner and I, Khalid Manju, met in 2006, um, during the Sumbandila program, some of our team members go way back to 1985 during the green set. So our, our, our history in Astrophica goes way back um, uh, um, from uh, the, the green set times, the sunset times, um, 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 and of course Sumbandila, uh, I can talk comfortably about it because it is the reason why I am I'm still here. Um, and, and when I heard that Motibi is also in the audience, I'm like, you know, Kamal, you, you, you did what we've been saying South Africa needs to do. We, we, we need to bring 
everybody on board if we want to sustain what we've started um, as, as, as South Africans and, and, and actually grow it. Because um, Astrophica, I, I usually say, it's a proud product of the government and the universities and private sectors working together because this model project was um, 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 really um, a, a program that brought together the government and the private sector because at the time it was some space and information systems um, uh, representing the private sector and the Stellenbosch University working together uh, for that. So Astrophica, um, even though it's, it's, it's um, 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 a startup, uh, we are a small company, but our roots go way back. We are a fully black owned company. Um, 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 both myself and, 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 and Khalid started this four years ago when we actually wanted to, to, to make the change. We saw the gap and we saw that we are in space because we want to see change, but things were not happening. And we were asking ourselves, what exactly is happening? So we then started Astrophica to actually focus on other sectors as well, like um, the ICT sector, transportation and renewable energy, using space um, 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 learned skills or IP that was developed in space, but um, 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 uh, wanting to use it in other sectors as well so that we, 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 we can improve um, um, their operations. Um, so, um, when we started Astrophica, we were still working for a company called Space Commercial Services, and we did not want to cut the umbilical cord because we're passionate about space. So we thought, let's rather start uh, with transportation, like the rail infrastructure and the ICT. But because we have um, 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 uh, our roots in space, uh, space pulled us back. I've always said once you've been beaten by the space bug, you can never leave. So we are still here. And on this slide, I'm sharing um, the satellites that we have worked on. Now, um, Hald and myself are AIT engineers. Um, I've, 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 I've actually moved very fast talking about it on the previous slide because I'm, 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 I'm just cognizant of the time. Uh, so these are the um, satellites that we've worked on. Um, on this picture, you can see that um, our, our background is not just um, um, on microsets, but on cubesets as well, uh, from 3U um, up to um, 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 microsets um, for the, at, at the size of 500 kilograms. Um, that's, that, those are the satellites that we, we, we have worked on. Now, um, I, I, I've touched a bit on, 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 on our skills as AIT um, um, engineers, and, and I've mentioned that in our team, uh, we have guys that were part of the green set and the sunset. Those guys um, um, bring in um, um, RF expertise um, because Hald and myself are only AIT and AIV um, um, engineers. Um, I know that the Brazilians um, are, are quite huge when it comes to AIT. Uh, when I was at the uh, International Space University, I met with quite a few Brazilians. Um, that's when um, uh, I got to know of the uh, AIT facilities as well. Um, that's where I actually think we as South Africans, especially because now there are talks of the Space Infrastructure Hub um, and, and, and our facilities uh, um, at Holtec uh, uh, um, uh, are about to be refurbished. I actually think there's um, a, a lot that we can actually um, um, collaborate on with the Brazilians and actually even learn from. Um, 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 our skills and specialties as, as AIT, um, my um, uh, Brazilian colleagues would know um, what, what AIT entails. Now, the only, um, uh, we also call this subsystems, the only subsystems that we design um, our harnessing, um, 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 those are the only ones that we design in-house. Um, we work with our industry uh, partners or industry stakeholders because what we do is AIT and we've 
always said we don't want to find ourselves competing um, with our suppliers and with our potential clients. So we focus on AIT uh, and being an AIT house, we, 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 we design the harnesses in-house and we also do our ground support equipments in-house because um, um, that's, that, 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 those are the equipments that we need um, when we um, are running um, the tests, uh, be it environmental tests, functional tests. Um, so um, um, uh, we, we, we specialize in, in that as well. Um, Astrophica has a number of projects that we have worked on. Uh, we have worked on ZAQ2, we assisted them um, um, with AIT and project management. ZAQ2 was launched um, in 2019, December, if I'm not mistaken. Actually, Davis has spoken about, um, um, uh, 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 about all these um, 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 satellites that we have launched as South Africans. Uh, we also had a chance to work with a company called Blueprint. Um, we helped them in, in putting together the space industry development policy framework. Um, they are researchers, therefore they needed um, uh, people who, who have a space background for them to understand what we as, 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 as space people are, are, are experiencing. And, how we feel um, um, things could be done to to improve um, 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 what we were um, um, currently um, 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 facing. Um, it is during this time, actually, I have to say that this was really a game changer for Astrophica because even though people know us as an AIT house, uh, during this time, we actually grew um, as, 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 as a company. This was a game changer to us because it gave us an exposure to the downstream. So for the first time, um, Astrophica got a chance to understand um, why we do what we are doing. Uh, we got a chance to interview a number of, 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 of companies on the downstream. That's when we actually realized that we need to do things differently as engineers. We need to uh, um, uh, understand what the end users requirements before we actually build these this sensors because as engineers we always have this tendency of 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 getting excited in developing ip we we build the sensors then we go back to the end user and say these are the data sets see what you can do with them so we actually turned this around we said let's understand the challenges and see what we can actually do um, um, uh, about that. So that, that actually um, 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 changed the way we're thinking about things. Um, during that time, we then decided that uh, we should have our own constellation that would actually cater for, for, for some of the challenges that we found that the, 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 the downstream or the end users were actually encountering, but they couldn't get from the data sets that they were currently getting or the products that were being developed using the data sets. So Astrophica then decided in, 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 in coming up with a solution that would cater for the solutions that were identified by the end users. Um, um, so we, we, our constellation, I'm trying to say that it was actually developed um, um, using the needs of the, it, it was challenge um, driven, um, um, uh, if I should put it that way. Um, we also had to then look at the market and see if it was viable, because for sure, if we look at the, at, at, at the needs of the end user and decide to come up with this, does it make any financial um, sense? Because at the end of the day, there are bills to be paid, kids have to go to school. So does it actually make sense? So we had to um, go out and do a market research and see if what we, we, we are actually um, going to embark on doing, does it make financial sense? Will it um, pay back the investors' money and stuff? Um, Astrophica also had a chance to be part of the technical team that drafted the master plan uh, for the aerospace and defense sector. Um, there are nine sectors that were chosen by the presidency. 
um, um, uh, 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 because they saw that there's actually a potential in, in, in generating more revenue uh, from these sectors, but that was not happening. So they wanted to find out what was the hindrance and, and Astrofica was a part of that team. Now, um, when I started, I mentioned that Astrofica, when, was for, when it was formed, uh, we also wanted to look at um, um, other sectors outside space, uh, like ICT. Um, I'm, 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 I'm happy to announce that as, as I speak, Astrofica has actually opened that door uh, because we've always been just in space and space and transportation because when we started, it was actually the transportation sector that was knocking on our door. Um, now, finally, uh, we have opened the ICD, uh, the ICT door. Uh, we are um, 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 running a program that will be um, 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 with us for three years, which is full spectrum monitoring. Now, um, because I'm, I'm a talker, I, I, I actually tell a story instead of um, uh, presenting. Now, I mentioned that um, we, we, we looked at the economic impact um, when we were um, 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 doing our market research to see if um, uh, our constellation would actually um, uh, be financially viable. My slide there with a lot of words, it's actually um, 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 outlining um, 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 uh, the economic um, impact on, on, on our aquaculture that we saw that um, with, with the current um, 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 solutions that we are getting, um, uh, it, 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 it really doesn't address those needs uh, because uh, harmful algal blooms travel very fast. So if you're going to wait um, for, 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 for the information after seven or 10 days, it, 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 it will not be sufficient um, um, to alert people on time that uh, we need to be aware of, of the hubs that are approaching our oceans. Um, our solution um, also looked into food security. Um, we know that with what we are currently getting with multispectral solutions, you would pick up um, that you are having challenges or, or constraints um, in your vegetation, but it wouldn't tell you um, the, what the problem is. And our solution is aiming at, at addressing that, that problem in, 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 in identifying what the problem is and not just um, where the problem is. Um, we also spoke um, to some of the people that um, spoke about um, climate smart agriculture and we saw that our, our, our solution would, would, would be a rightful fit in, in addressing that. I've spoken about the market opportunity and commercial value gap that we've identified uh, during our, our market analysis um, um, uh, uh, before we, we, we actually um, made a decision to, 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 to start. Um, I think I made it in 10 minutes, Kamal. Uh, that is all from us. Thanks again for the opportunity. Jesse, thank you so very much for that. I think it was very impressive to see in just the space of a few years what uh, you and Khalid have done with Astrophica. So best of luck for the next few decades that lie ahead of you. So thank you very much. Um, I think the B2Bs are going to be a great opportunity to, to interact with you and you with clearly your network in Brazil already. So best of luck with that. Um, I see lots of matchmaking going on in the chat groups, which is excellent. That's the exact reason for this for the session so please keep it up uh, and again before we before we end uh, taking us into the close Andiswa Silinga who is the CEO of uh, Gemini GIS and Environmental Services Andiswa uh, welcome and the floor is all yours uh, thank you Kamal um, I hope you can hear me. Am I audible? You're audible and your slides are up, so all good. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Andy Swasilinga. I'm a co-founder of Gemini GIS and Environmental Services. Uh, I do have a partner, her name is Danki Sopita. I'm more from the uh, GIS environment and using a lot of um, earth observation products for our solutions. Um, our journey started uh, 12 years ago uh, with us wanting to contribute in improving the quality of living for the society and the communities we stay in. So uh, seeing the negative impact that companies in the mining and construction industries posed onto the environment, we had to play our part in making sure that uh, these companies can operate and at the same time protect the environment. And um, the South African environmental regulations, um, they enforce the protection of uh, biodiversity and um, a number of businesses now are taking environmental responsibility seriously by promoting sustainable use of raw materials and natural resources and um, protect the lives of the communities uh, they operate in. Um, we have a 25 years, more than 25 years combined experience uh, in the geospatial and remote sensing and environmental management. And we've worked a lot uh, in the mining industry and also in the construction industry. Um, and um, what we trying to do or this, the problem that we're trying to solve is uh, making sure that the mining companies and the construction companies, uh, they protect the environment while they are also operating and um, making their own money. And we have a team of five young dynamic practitioners um, that provide our clients and partners with solutions to help them to be continuously alert of any environmental risks in their operations. Um, they also, uh, our solutions also make sure that they know exactly where the sensitive environmental features are so that they can take uh, well-measured precautions to preserve these features while operating. And we have uh, collaborated with a number of other specialists in the uh, different fields to help uh, our clients to be compliant and also improve their bottom line. So on the environmental side, this, these are the uh, services that we offer to our clients whenever they have to um, start an activity, either building a road, or uh, building a, a mall or building um, uh, houses. We assist them with environmental impact assessments. And during their operation, because uh, sometimes when they operate, there's a lot of dust that uh, goes on. So we assist them to comply with the water and air quality regulations by doing their water and air quality monitoring. And if they have to extract water from the water uh, sources that are around their operations. We help them with the application of the water use licenses. And we also make sure that they comply with the environmental authorizations that have been given to them uh, that will allow them uh, to, to operate. And um, for us to be able to provide an efficient um, service and also um, value add solutions to our clients. We use a lot of technology and we are huge believers in um, infusing, infusing technologies like um, GIS, remote sensing, and also um, uh, drone technologies. So um, as part of our service offering, so we use these uh, technologies uh, like GIS. As I said, I'm more from the GIS uh, background. Uh, we use a lot of GIS uh, solutions uh, to provide data management for our clients because sometimes we find out that our clients have got a lot of data and they didn't even know that there's a lot of uh, information and insights that they can get from that data. So 
we help them a lot to dig deep into their data and um, managing it and uh, standardize it and allowing it to uh, be used for further special analysis and modeling. And we also uh, making sure that they visualize the outputs of their analysis and modeling um, on a, a user-friendly platforms um, and also can be able to report to the authorities whenever they are required to. And um, whilst we were uh, doing uh, all these uh, services and, and giving them the solutions, uh, we got interested in the drone uh, technology, which is one of the areas that we have recently um, invested in. Uh, so we, we, we putting together a fleet of drones uh, so that we are able to collect information, um, especially information that is near to real time, because that is most important for our clients to be able to make uh, more informed decisions. Um, and we're using, um, we're trying to get lots of uh, uh, sensors as well uh, to, to be attached to the uh, drones so that we can be able to collect as much information as possible. And whilst we're doing that, um, we use a lot of um, observa um, observation uh, data to be able to um, provide the solutions that our clients uh, need. And um, one of the areas that uh, we got interested in, and uh, it is also part of our diversification strategy, that um, we should not only look at uh, mining and construction. Uh, we also started to look at uh, agriculture, which I think is one of the areas that um, uh, we can provide a lot of value on with the technologies that we're using together with the earth observations um, information that we use. Um, so we are in a process of building a prototype. Um, and this was presented in one of the challenges uh, with Sansa. Uh, and we, we were the finalists and we won the prize for, for our proposal. So uh, though it's taking us time to actually come up with the full system, but we are getting ahead in terms of making sure that we're building something that is going to add value to our uh, agriculture um, clients and our farmers that we want to focus on. Um, so what uh, we are doing at the moment is that we are building a prototype for a solution that will assist especially smallholder farmers because those are the ones that don't normally get um, a lot of support. Uh, so we've, we said, uh, though we're going to be focusing on, on commercial farmers, but specifically smallholder farmers are the um, clients that we want to focus on and, and assist. So our solution is going to assist them to be able to observe, assess and control farming practices such as uh, crop production, disease monitoring, uh, weed control, um, and how to use uh, pesticides and fertilizers more effectively. And um, we have uh, partnered with um, uh, one of the universities in South Africa uh, to be able to come up with this prototype. We've also had discussions with Sansa in terms of them asking, um, assisting us, especially on the technical side. Uh, we've had um, partnerships with them where they've given us opportunities and um, uh, of training, especially on the technical side on, on how to develop um, uh, solutions and also um, how to integrate the, the outputs from the technologies that they are using um, together with the drone uh, information that we will be collecting. So that is a very good uh, relationship that we have there and um, looking forward to uh, more collaboration uh, with, other, with other partners for us to have a, a very successful solution here. And then um, part of our social responsibility, um, we, we are a, a continuously developing a small business. And um, we want to make sure that our capabilities and our competencies 
um, allow us to be able to operate globally, where we'll be able to operate in a multidimensional ecosystem that does not only engage uh, with our customers only, but with also our partners, contributors, market makers that have influence in the industry and all of them linked through an interactive platform that creates shared value and wealth for all participants. So as part of uh, our development, uh, we also have a, a social responsibility uh, project that deals with a number of projects within the company. Um, so based on our background and how we got to where we are, at this point in time. Um, I remember when I started with the CSIR, I was given a lot of opportunities uh, for me to be able to know how to use GIS. It was new at the time uh, when I started, uh, but uh, it got me where I am today. So I felt that I need to give back to the um, community and um, start internship programs with graduates from a, a number of uh, technical colleges and also universities and um, actually teach them the technologies that are out there and even give them an opportunity to be able to develop solutions that could solve some of the problems that are out there. So our internship program is running well at this point in time, um, though uh, we cannot have people working in our offices, so we're running it uh, virtually at, at, this, and at this point in time. And we also get involved uh, with the schools because we believe that we need to protect our environment, we need to clean our environment. So we're trying to teach uh, the young, uh, the, the young uh, people that wherever they are, they need to make sure that they take care of the environment because that is where all our food, that is where all our bene we benefit from from the environment um, and um, we also um, developed an application as also part of us giving back to the community um, an application which is more gis um, uh, related um, one of the issues that we've identified is that with a number of schools, especially the disadvantaged schools, uh, on a daily basis, they have to print out uh, paper, they have to, um, they have to uh, do the screening on a daily basis. So we said, um, how can we assist uh, the schools to save them on paper? Um, and to make sure that their screening process is more efficient. So we developed this um, screening app for them that they can use on their mobile devices and, um, and be able to, uh, to assess um, the number of uh, learners that are coming in and also the, um, the people that might be affected. Um, so all these uh, projects are also playing part in, our, in, de in the development of our um, company and also the development of uh, specialists in the field, both in uh, geospatial and remote sensing. Um, I think I will end there. Uh, thank you very much for listening to our presentation and looking forward to future collaborations. Thank you. Jesse, thank you so much. I think that's a phenomenal way to end today. I love this idea of a, a fleet of drones and your focus on, on uh, serving the agricultural sector is right on the money. I think highly relevant for our continent uh, and, and uh, hopefully to the Brazilian market as well. So ladies and gentlemen, we've successfully managed to overshoot our time by close to 30 minutes. So we're not gonna keep you much longer on a delayed closer. Uh, suffice to thank all the speakers, thank you all for the uh, very engaging chats, the Q and A's, um, and we're looking forward to a very productive B2B session starting at the same time tomorrow. So please go back, check if you've got your links. If you haven't, then please get hold of us on, on the emails that, that I've already sent you invitations uh, for day one, and we'll make sure that you get the link for tomorrow uh, and, and try and engage with uh, your Brazilian or South African counterparts. So once again, Thanks very much. Enjoy the evening. If you're South African, you please be aware. Load shedding starts in about a minute. Uh, so hopefully you're not impacted. And if you're Brazilian, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, Herman, a mention of gratitude to Herman Teron, who's been behind the scenes managing the swap-ins and swap-outs of the videos. Herman, thank you so much. 
um, for supporting us so phenomenally today from, from Senza. Um, I'm handing back to you to, to, uh, to shut down the webinar for today. Thank you very much, Herman.